A message from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Every year is another record-breaking year for extreme weather conditions and climate events. As a low-lying coastal state, Guyana is acutely aware of the high toll of these extreme weather conditions. But equally costly is climate resilience. Developing countries are thus set between a rock and a hard place. The only way to ease this burden is through concerted and balanced climate action, especially biomitigation, climate financing, technical cooperation, and capacity building. On the 29th of October 2020, the Cooperative Republic of Ghana will, in its capacity as chair of the Group of 77 and China, host a virtual ministerial level meeting under the theme, Maintaining a Low Carbon Development Path Towards the 2030 Agenda in the Era of COVID-19. Join His Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Vice President, the Honorable Barra Jagdio, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, the Honorable Hugh Todd, and representatives from over 130 countries for the forum as they come together to address issues such as climate change and sustainable development within the context of a global COVID-19 recovery plan. We urge the international community to strengthen its efforts to counter these trends and protect the ecosystems, including the restoration of degraded forests and to substantially increase afforestation, reforestation and conservation globally. Based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Join the conversation on October 29 via DPI, NCN Facebook and YouTube. For more information, visit www.minfo.gov.gy. The Cooperative Republic of Guyana was elected in 2019 to serve as the 2020 chair of the largest negotiating group of developing countries in the United Nations, the Group of 77, G77 and China. This accession demonstrated the group's strong support and confidence in Guyana. At its November 22, 2019 plenary, the 134 member states of the group elected Guyana by acclamation without preconditions. Guyana committed to strengthening multilateralism for the benefit of all developing countries, including by presiding over global sustainable development and climate change negotiations, and efforts to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the organization. Former Minister of Foreign Affairs Carlin Rodriguez Burkett has been appointed Guyana's permanent representative to the United Nations. Mrs. Rodriguez Burkett, in a recent interview with the DPI, said Guyana has taken up the chairmanship of the G77 at a significant time. On Thursday, October 29, Guyana will host its flagship event on the occasion of its chairmanship of this major group under the theme maintaining a low-carbon development path towards the 2030 agenda in the era of COVID-19. This event aims to bring together ministerial and expert-level representatives from the membership of the Group of 77 and China to achieve several objectives. These objectives are 1. To provide a space for awareness, partnership building, knowledge sharing and lesson learning among the G77 and China membership on climate action amidst the COVID-19 crisis while recovering towards the 2030 agenda. 2. To reinforce the Group of 77's position on key issues in the climate change discussion, including climate finance and ecosystems-based approaches, while also contributing to maximizing SDG co-benefits. And 3. To produce a presidential communique that highlights the main concerns and actions of the group. These objectives will be realized through four technical sessions. Given the existential threats posed by climate change, there leaves no room for delayed actions or reneging on commitments in this regard. It is against this background that the event will be hosted. The government of Guyana has noted a need for the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement to maintain the importance of the climate crisis in all actions and at all levels. 
It was pointed out that implementation of more ambitious climate actions in the global south requires sustained financing, given the weakening impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on regional, national and local economies. The government says the pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of our health and social systems, the fragility of our economies, the unsustainability of our relationship with nature, and the gaping inequalities in our world. The poorest and most vulnerable have been the hardest hit and face the most uncertain paths to recovery. Decades of progress towards eradicating poverty and other deprivations stand to be reversed. The flagship event will also highlight the need for enhanced solidarity and greater systemic resilience amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Mrs. Rodriguez Burkett further explained the importance of the event in pushing this agenda. Basically what this event is going to do or is going to focus on is on maintaining a low carbon development path in the context of COVID, uh, keeping our eyes on achieving the sustainable development agenda. And this event is being held by us in our capacity um, as chair of the G77 and China. But what we are trying to do here is to remind the world that yes, we have the pandemic and yes, we have to deal with the pandemic, but that should not put a low carbon development uh, pathway to sustainable development on the back burner. As you know, um, our government and in, in particular, I would say the PPP civic government, we have uh, for many, many years been pushing for a low carbon development path. We have done our part in Guyana on that. And so this um, event will bring together a number of ministers and experts, including the uh, executive uh, secretary of the UNFCCC. We have the, um, the head of ECLAC would be there. We would also have the uh, assistant secretary general um, who is a special advice on climate change to the Secretary General of the UN. And we will have the UN Secretary General as well sending a message at that meeting. The response to the pandemic the government posits must now aim to build fairer and more inclusive, resilient and sustainable societies and economies. It should strive to realize the transformations necessary to address the challenges related to climate change and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Therefore, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, together with the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, represent a global roadmap for the recovery from COVID-19 and for an equitable and sustainable future. They must be at the heart of COVID-19 recovery plans. In terms of what Guyana, I think, would bring in these last months, because we're in the last months of this chairmanship, I think is that reminder that we must not uh, forego what we have committed to in the Paris Agreement, in several other agreements, in the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, just because we have COVID now. In fact, we have to accelerate it even more so because of the pandemic. While Guyana is a small country, the UN Permanent Representative said in its current position of the G77 chair, its contributions are pivotal. We have a small group of people working very hard every day uh, you cannot see it, um, I would say, um, you know, the work that is happening here in, in New York, because many times it's difficult for people to translate what is happening in a lot of the committees in the UN um, to their everyday lives. But this is the place where it's a global laboratory, I would say, for solutions for global issues. And so when we talk about the, our, the, about the a, a low carbon development path and, and the climate change agreement, th this is where these decisions um, and these commitments have been have been made. And you ask um, what Guyana would be um, remembered for, but it is our chairmanship. I'm pretty late in the game, as you, as you know, um, we, we have a, a few months, but I think that notwithstanding the circumstances in which we took this chairmanship, I think we have done well. I have colleagues and um, staff from the mission here, you know, leading the discussions on the budget for the United Nations, for example. I have staff here leading the discussion on the communications in the United Nations. How did the organization get its message um, out there? Uh, we, we have staff on, in, the, in the discussions on, on climate leading these discussions. And so while you're talking to me and you are not seeing them, we have a good group here. And also in Guyana, we, we have a good group um, 
you know, Dr. Paulette Bino is working on the climate issues leading um, that discussion um, from, from Capital. Now that we have a virtual world, we can do that from, from, from there. Among several other outcomes, the sessions to be hosted at the flagship event seek to explore innovative ways in which the global financial architecture can improve access for developing countries to maintain a climate resilient development pathway in the context of the 2030 Agenda.
Forbes July. Good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am Forbes July, Director of the Department of International Cooperation, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Guyana. I would like to formally declare or open this session, and uh, I would also like to lay down a few ground rules in order to ensure that our event progresses smoothly today. We would appreciate if your microphones are yes, muted, muted once, once you're not addressing, you're not addressing the, the, meeting. the meeting. Secondly, Secondly uh, we would also appreciate your camera, camera being, being, on being on when speaking. When speaking. And thirdly, you may use the raised hand icon to indicate your intention to speak. I therefore now hand you over to the Honorable Hugh Todd, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Minister Todd. Thank you very much, Ambassador. His Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, United Nations System Heads, Honorable Brigadier Retired Mark Phillips, Prime Minister of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Honorable Ministers of the Group of 77 and China, Colleague Ministers of Government and other Members of Parliament, Distinguished Heads of Agencies of the United Nations System, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, Distinguished Delegates, I extend warm greetings to you from Georgetown, Guyana. It is my honor, on behalf of the Government and people of Guyana, to welcome you to this flagship event convened by this G77 Chairmanship under the theme Maintaining a Low Carbon Development Path Towards the 2030 Agenda in the Era of COVID-19. While for us in this part of the world, the day is just beginning, for many of you, it is already far spent. For others still, we are well into the night season. It behoves me, therefore, to thank you all most sincerely for the sacrifice you are making to participate in this event. We meet an, at an important crossroads in international relations. Just a few days ago, the United Nations celebrated the, the 75th anniversary of its founding. However, multilateralism is under stress, as even global challenges multiply and intensify. Raised to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, the organization now witnesses a world at war with an invisible enemy, the coronavirus. To name but one of the myriad of threats to peace and development facing human family. The virus has claimed more than 1 million lives in a mere 10 months, with more than 40 million, 42 million cases worldwide. Many of these cases and deaths are in developing countries, members of the group of 77. It is possible that some of the best lessons in the fight against this pandemic might, be well, might, might well be drawn from within our group. The circumstances of our meeting illustrate this in striking terms the challenges the world faces as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. They illustrate equal, equally the opportunities inherent in these challenges. The pandemic has imposed itself on every facet of human life and taken a toll on the livelihoods of millions across the globe. It remains a threat to life and livelihoods in the future. 
undermining economies and accentuating social inequalities and poverty. It also compounds that most critical of global challenges, the existential threat, existential and, and pervasive threat posed by climate change, which is the focus of our current deliberations. We must overcome this menace if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals and, ri and rise to the promise of the Paris Agreement. On both accounts, our world is dangerously off course. But COVID-19, even as it threatens, it also teaches. The link between health and sustainability has been sharply underlined. And we are learning, to f and we are learning by force of necessity that, most, that much more can be delivered even today with a smaller carbon footprint. The group of 77 in China has no doubt significantly reduced the carbon footprint associated with, its, meet, with, with its, meet, its meetings during the course of the current year, as has the United Nations. It is therefore imperative that the lessons from COVID-19 that conduce to the low carbon development path be fully documented, analyzed, embraced and implemented as and where applicable. It is Ghana's hope as chair in the seminal year 2020 that the G77 and China will be able to contribute in thinking and action to a more healthy and sustainable world, keeping the existential threat posed by climate change at the center of global attention. It is a threat that leaves no room for delayed actions or backsliding on commitments. Hence, our meeting today. The flagship event convened by the government of Guyana in its capacity as 2020 chair of the Group of 77 in China seeks to bring together ministerial and expert level representatives from the membership of the Group of 77 and China. Its three principal objectives are clearly defined in the available concept notes. These object objectives will be realized through four sessions that will focus on more ambitious climate actions, including with respect to the provision of climate finance, lessons learned from COVID-19 experiences, and implications for combating climate change and achieving the 2030 agenda, as well as benefits of ecosystem-based approaches to climate change. His Excellency, Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, will set the stage for this event with his opening address, outlining his vision and way forward and expectations of an action-oriented roadmap. I express our sincere gratitude to His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, who so graciously consented to deliver the keynote address. We are also grateful to the ministers, agency heads, experts, and other representatives that have kindly agreed to make presentations or serve as moderators or discussants on various topics. I am sure that our deliberations will be greatly enriched by their contribution. The communicate to be issued at the end of our deliberations will highlight the key messages emanating from this flagship event. While it is not a negotiated outcome, every effort will be made to take into account commitments from members of the group. To that end, a draft was circulated earlier this week. With these few words, I once again bid you warm welcome and express the hope that, the, that our deliberations will help to advance our collective understanding of the issues that need to be addressed and the steps and of the steps to be taken in the foreseeable future to build a more inclusive, healthy, sustainable, and secure world. I thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana and the current chair of the Group of 77 and China to deliver 
the opening address. Mr. President. His Excellency, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Honorable Ministers Honorable of Government, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, Your Excellency Executive Secretary, Secretary, Secretary Ambassadors, Ambassadors, Distinguished Delegates, 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 Delegates and Gentlemen. And gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. In some cases, some some good, good evening. It is a distinct, distinct honor for my country, my Guyana, country Guyana, Guyana, a coastal, low-lying, developing country from the Caribbean sub-region, and for me, gender in the era of COVID-19. This theme cause, causes us to examine the interrelation between the pandemic, climate change, and sustainable development. In the context of the world's extant challenges, these three areas must be addressed in an integrated manner if we, as developing countries, are to redefine our part for the future. This gathering will afford us the opportunity to facilitate awareness build partnerships, share lessons, learning, learning, knowledge, and experiences about climate actions amidst the COVID-19 crisis, and to discuss our key issues and concerns about climate change as we navigate towards the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In short, we have an opportunity here to enhance our collective enterprise in order to strengthen the prospects for sustainable development climate security, and a COVID-19-free world. Climate change, the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic threatens the fight against climate change by diverting our attention from the gravity of the environmental dangers we face while threatening to reverse the gains made in our quest towards the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. The COVID-19 pandemic has coincided with a series of unrepented hazards storms, wildfires, floods, and droughts, all linked to unacceptable levels of global warming and climate change. The immediate task of containing, mitigating, and eventually eradicating the COVID-19 coronavirus must not force us to ignore the challenges of protecting the environment and the need for collective action. Unfortunately, the pandemic has led to the cancellation and postponement of numerous high-level climate-focused talks and events, including the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26. Nonetheless, I wish to use this opportunity to applaud those who have remained steadfast in their commitment to the global climate and environmental crisis, even in the face of this deadly pandemic. For many of the United Nations member states, the pandemic has adversely affected the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and threatens the success gained in SDG milestones. Resources allocated for climate action and advancing progress for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals have had to be redirected to combat this pandemic. It is for this reason that Guyana supports the call for placing the SDGs at the center of the pandemic recovery efforts. Climate change and sustainable development are important interlinking uh, factors that we have to deal with. Climate change is another potent threat to sustainable development. The devastating effects of climate change are real. Extreme weather events and other natural disasters have adversely impacted our environment, our economies, and our societies including the reversal of development gains. Climate change, therefore, must be placed properly in the context of the discourse of sustainable development. In this regard, as G77 countries, we must consider the impact of climate change on issues such as poverty reduction and economic and social development. Sustainable development goal number one commits us to end poverty in all its forms, everywhere. Poverty remains a monumental global challenge, but one which has to be overcome. 
Poverty shackles human development and impairs human dignity. We must continue our efforts to reduce poverty through climate adaptation, which helps to protect the poor. The real principle of common but differentiated responsibilities allows each of us to play a part within our means. The principle now enshrined in international environmental law recognizes that, recognizes that all countries have an obligation to address problems concerning the environment. But it also acknowledges that not all are blessed with the same capabilities. Pandemic and sustainable development is, has an interrelationship. The interrelation of current pandemic and sustainable development goals is a source of concern for all, since the pandemic is depleting our financial and human capital assets. Our strategies to combat the impact of COVID-19 pandemic have forced countries to increase their internal and external debt. This is likely to need lead to negative growth and exacerbate poverty. When these happen, destruction of our fragile natural resources will be the first casualty. We should not allow our gains in sustainable development to be eroded by the pandemic. Poverty alleviation programs should be actively funded so as to protect the natural environment. This brings me to Guyana's low carbon development strategy. Mr. Chairman, Guyana as a net carbon sink is particularly vulnerable to climate change because of its geography and historic settlement patterns. The adverse and potentially catastrophic impact of climate change are already conspicuous. conspicuous. The country has suffered from extreme weather events such as the flood of 20, 2005, which destroyed 60% of the country's GDP. It has also experienced several localized extreme weather events, including intense rainfall and droughts in the hinterland regions. These have endangered livelihoods and food security. My government intends to be more proactive in its effort to combat the effects of climate change while at the same time advancing our development aspirations. In this regard, I wish to highlight the role of Guyana's low carbon development strategy. The LCDS is aimed at transforming Guyana's economy to better deliver greater socioeconomic benefits to our people by following a low carbon development path, while at the same time mainstreaming climate resilience. As part of the LCDS, and working in partnership with the Kingdom of Norway, Guyana was able to develop and implement one of the first national scale payment for, climate, for forest climate services through avoided deforestation and sustainable management of our forest resources. We remain committed to advancing the LCDS and to collaborate with international partners to expand our work on Red Plus and payment for climate or forest climate and ecosystem services. Mr. Chairman, I make the call here today for an integrated response to the threat posed by the pandemic. The climate crisis and the adverse effects of these on the sustainable development goals. As I have pointed out, the pandemic is diverting attention and resources from climate action and the SDGs. It is necessary, therefore, for the response to the pandemic and the climate crisis be placed at the center of advancement of the sustainable development goals. In response to these challenges, I call on the international community to ensure greater financing is provided to meet the 2030 agenda on sustainable development, particularly in the post-COVID-19 era. Adaptation to climate change is of vital importance and a key component for the implementation of the Paris Agreement for developing countries within G77 and China. In this light, adequate capacity building, financial support, and technology transfer are critical. As chairman of the Group of 77 and China, I call for greater access to climate financing for developing countries. 
Many developing countries, due to high indebtedness, are constrained in their efforts to generate sufficient resources towards achieving the 2030 Agenda. I call on international financial community to explore and implement ways where debt can be reduced so as to allow developing countries the fiscal space to achieve the SDGs. Mr. Chairman, Diana proudly accepts its shares of responsibility for climate action, fighting the pandemic and advancing along the path to sustainable development. In this regard, <clears throat> Guyana's forest resource is one of the principal natural assets which can be utilized to generate the revenue needed for the growth and development of our country. We can maintain our forests to help in the global fight against climate change. If you receive adequate financial resources, especially during this era of COVID-19. Mr. Chairman, everyone is acutely aware of the need for collective action to protect our planet, planet and humanity. As I have said before, multilateralism is the key to unlocking solutions to humanity's problem. Issues of poverty, physical and social vulnerabilities, lack of adequate financing, inadequate preparedness, and economic retrogression can be addressed effectively if we act together. And the G77 is so positioned to act. As I conclude, I would like to urge all of us to reflect on ways in which we can make our country stronger and more responsive to combating the challenges posed by climate change in the current era of COVID-19. I would like to assure the international community of Guyana's commitment to advancing the movement against climate change and achieving the 2030 Agenda through concerted action and shared responsibilities. I thank you. We'll now move to a keynote address by His Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Excellencies, I thank the government of Guyana for organizing this meeting of the Group of 77 and China to discuss climate change in the context of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic and the measures to address its impact have been halting or reversing progress achieved on many of the Sustainable Development Goals. As usual, the vulnerable are the first and hardest hit. Up to 115 million people may be pushed into extreme poverty this year, on top of already unacceptable levels. Millions of people have lost jobs and livelihoods. Education for almost 90% of students has been interrupted. Attending online has not been an option for almost a third. And the nourishment is on the rise, childhood vaccination services are threatened, and care for other diseases has been severely disrupted. Meanwhile, the climate emergency continues unabated, again threatening progress across the SDGs. G77 members are among the countries at greatest risk from the impacts of climate disruption. Ambitious multilateral action and solidarity are needed to save lives and livelihoods from the pandemic and the climate crisis. We need to use the recovery from COVID-19 to put us back on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and to win the battle against climate change. Climate action will be central to all our efforts. We need to attain the goals of the Paris Agreement. That means limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, supporting adaptation and climate resilience, and working together net zero emissions before 2050. Currently, the world is way off track. The last decade was the warmest on record, and we are witnessing more frequent and severe impacts from wildfires, floods, droughts and storms in every region. Climate action can help rebuild our economies, create millions of better jobs, and improve our health as we replace polluting industries with clean, efficient technologies. It can provide the engine for growth in developing countries that will eradicate poverty and drive sustained improvements in human development. 
to promote a sustainable COVID recovery, we have set out six climate positive actions that countries and other stakeholders can take. Invest in sustainable jobs and businesses. Ensure no more bailouts to polluting industries and then subsidies to fossil fuels, especially coal. Consider climate risks in our financial decisions and policy making. Work together and ensure no one is left behind. I count on members of the Group of 75, 77 and China to serve as the global role models for a green, inclusive and sustainable recovery. The countries you represent have historically been among the strongest advocates for the SDGs and ambitious climate action. The world needs your leadership now more than ever. In advance of COP26 next year, I'm encouraging all governments to submit more ambitious natural, nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement that are consistent with global net zero emissions by 2050. These plans need to promote policies, investments and actions that are carbon neutral, create decent jobs and protect nature. I thank those of you that have already submitted a more ambitious NDC and a strategy to get to net zero emissions. And I thank the governments that have pledged to do so. I encourage you to use the December 12th summit. I will co-convene with the leaders of the United Kingdom, France, Italy and Chile to announce your climate plans, NDC strategies, as well as the concrete policy measures that will take us to net zero. I also hope to see more ambitious commitments on adaptation and resilience. It is essential that the most vulnerable and shielded from the worst are shielded from the worst impacts of climate disruption. But adaptation and resilience are currently vastly under-resourced. To that end, I'm urging the developed countries to fully capitalize the adaptation and resilience initiatives launched at the Climate Action Summit. They need to be fully operational and scaled up. The Paris Agreement emphasizes the importance of common but differentiated responsibilities in light of national circumstances. Most of you will need financial and technical support to recover from COVID-19 and to scale up your climate ambition. A critical part of this will be enhanced financial assistance. That includes the decade-long goal of mobilizing 100 billion US dollars a year for mitigation and adaptation. That is one of the reasons why I have been co-leading the Financing for Development Initiative with Jamaica and Canada. I'm also encouraging developing countries and financial institutions to use the Financing Common Summit as well as the December 12th Summit to announce new and more ambitious climate finance commitments. And I'm asking governments as well as, as, well as public and multilateral development banks to work with you on addressing debt and liquidity to liberate resources to achieve the SDGs and the goals of the Paris Agreement. For your part, I count on your Minister of Finance to engage with colleagues on the boards of multilateral banks to use their voting power to push for alignment with net zero goals and the strong enhancement of support for resilience and adaptation. Together, we can emerge from the crisis stronger, more sustainable and more resilient. Thank you. That was the keynote address by the Secretary General. I must apologize. Uh, I actually should have introduced um, one item before that, and I will go to that now. Um, I would like to introduce the Honorable Andres Ayamand, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Chile and the Chair of COP25. You have the floor. the crucial issue of climate change, especially for developing countries. As everybody knows, climate change is the most serious global threat that we are facing now and will face in the future. We are encouraged to see how G77 and China countries are showing leadership. The recent announcement of China is a very important one aiming at peaking emissions by 2030 and achieving carbon neutrality before 2060. Also, mitigation is important. We cannot leave adaptation and finance behind. Adaptation is a priority for all of us and must be a central component of our global response. 
Equally, finance must be available, available for all developing countries, and especially to those that are particularly vulnerable. Mr. Chairman, let me tell you that Chile is also doing its part. We were one of the first countries to communicate a stronger NDC earlier this year, which reflects our strong commitment of being part of the solution. In our NDC, we commit to cut down emissions in num absolute numbers by 2030 and as, as a midpoint to carbon neutrality by 2050. Our NDC also includes a very important component that has largely been forgotten, the ocean. The ocean is a source of well-being for millions of people. It absorbs nearly 30% of all emissions and almost 90% of the additional heat produced by global warming. The ocean must be protected from this enormous stress. This is why Chile has strongly advocated that the ocean receives the attention it deserves as part of the global response to climate change and, of course, in the context of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We call on all parties to include the ocean in NDCs. We call to increase our blue ambition in adaptation and mitigation. Mr. Chairman, I want to finish expressing gratitude to Guyana for organizing this flagship event. The G77 and China has a central role to play in combating change, climate change, as it represents a vast majority of countries and world population. Working together can be crucial for the benefit of our people and for the well-being of future generations. Thank you very much. We now move to the first session, Ministerial Interventions Framing the, the, framing the Discourse. And I have the honor and privilege, privilege to introduce to you Honorable Dr. Bar Jagdio, Vice President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the point you made about framing the discourse. I know that a lot of our colleagues have been questioning why another conference of this nature? Don't we have too many on climate change already? And they had some misgivings about what the focus of this engagement will be. So I shall try in the next couple of minutes to outline to you what we are hoping to achieve, Guyana and hopefully as a group out of this engagement here today. First of all, we are not here to prove the science of climate change. That has already been proven and accepted. We are not here to debate the outcome or the impact of climate change because most people in this room and across the world have been witnessing and experiencing this firsthand in a way that is of almost existential through various hurricanes, rising sea level, flooding, drought, and a whole host of other activities. So we're now here to prove that again. We also have some facts that are known to everyone on this field. First of all, that the Paris pledges, as welcome as they were, were never enough to achieve the outcome that we desire, which is a two degrees rise or even below two degrees rise in global temperature above pre-industrial level. So we know that too. And we also know that even before COVID, many countries were not uh, on track to achieve those pledges, um, although they were inadequate to achieve the two-degree target. So 
We're extremely worried that now because of COVID-19, because of its widespread in impacts, some of which have been outlined by the Secretary General, millions of people have gone into absolute poverty. Millions, more hundreds of millions are now facing starvation. Nearly half a billion people have lost their jobs. The impact of COVID has, uh, the economic impact is probably going to exceed a hundred trillion dollars. Um, and trillions have been spent on stimulus packages in many parts of the world. The fear is that this, because of the impact on the economy, that this will be used as an excuse to weaken ambition and weaken financing. And this happened before, in about a decade ago when we had the global financial crisis and with its devastating impact for many countries, which were less than COVID-19, many countries, particularly in the developed world, use that as an excuse not to raise ambition, nor to provide the adequate finances that are, or to meet the, the pledges that they had already made. So one of the primary purposes of this exercise is to say notwithstanding the COVID-19 impact on our economies, given which, and we're hoping COVID-19 would have more of a short-term impact, at least in its, from its medical aspects, would have a longer-term impact in relation to the economy. But we're faced with an ex existential threat here that will not go away. If anything, it's getting worse. If you look at the, the science coming out, some of the warmest years are now and we, uh, with, with its impact on the ecology, et cetera. So we cannot lose sight of this. And this is a powerful group, the G77 and China, 134 countries. And if we are going to go next year to COP, COP in Glasgow, this, this engagement today is to say that we have to find some level of solidarity in this group if we want to achieve higher levels of ambition and dedicated and adequate financing to avert to the, the excesses, to finance mitigation actions and adaptation actions. We can only do that through solidarity. Now, this group is made up of a disparate uh, set of countries, from small island states to some very large countries. And each of us may have our own priorities and often in climate change negotiations, sometimes we contradict each other. And if we can find uh, an outcome that accommodates the concerns of all of these countries, then we can go to the COP with a great sense of solidarity for the centrality of what we are here for, ambition and financing. So Guyana's case, the president outlined how we have a national scale model on climate change for, for decarbonizing the entire economy and adapting to climate change, an entire national scale model. But we have recently become an oil producer. And we're, by, by 2025, we'll be producing half a million barrels per day. Does this change our position now on climate change, carbon pricing, or so the removal of subsidies from fuel? No, the answer is no. Although we would be an exporter of oil. So there are groups, the countries in this group that are major exporters of, of oil, etc. So we have to find a livable out outcome. And that is why we're hoping an exchange today will take place with, with the concerns of the various groups coming forward. And and as we move forward, a year from now, when we go to the next COP, and even before then, this group will work to build a sense of solidarity. Secondly, it will ensure that even now, that 
the, the climate organizations where there are pools of resources like Jeff, et cetera, World Bank, other places that are intermediating climate funds. They're just sitting for too long on these resources. There has to be a speeding up of, of these resources to be intermediated to the countries, particularly countries with limited capability. You have heard the problems of COVID and the huge debt burden and the need for greater liquidity and the lack of fiscal space in many of these countries where they have to divert valuable funds to address medical issues. They badly need money now if they're going to deal with adaptation measures, et cetera. But many of them are still getting a couple hundred thousand dollars and dealing with readiness issues. We need financing at scale now, not in the future, but now. And there are already pools of money where pledges have been made that we have to work as a group to unlock. And we pro probably will need the solidarity of the group and the bigger countries in this group to help us to do that. So that is also a very, very important point that we need, we need to, to have. Um, thirdly, we need to prepare, use this period to plan for the future. Again, countries with limited capabilities, they have their planning mechanism, their ability to, inter, to use in their development plans, climate outcomes as one of the variables for the for me a sustainable medium term economic plan is lacking that capability and this group has to help each other the different groups there so i can go on but i think already my time is up um and this was the idea of bringing the group together g77 we unfortunately we couldn't do it as a group because it takes a long time and you have to negotiate outcomes and everything else. But Guyana thought it important to bring our colleagues from across the G77 to have a document. It's not a negotiated outcome, but at least can reflect some of the country experiences and get our colleagues to share their ideas along those lines, not reproving the science, not going over the trodden ground, but ensuring that we have outcomes that will move the system along to um, achieving that two degrees rise or a 1.5 degree rise. And, where, and that means enhancing ambition and more financing for many of these countries. A lot of countries have great plans for decarbonizing the economy, but they are languishing because of lack of funding. And so, Help, how can we help to unlock funds? So this is, if we are defining what we are doing here today, we are hoping the presentations would go along those lines, helping us to, to move those issues forward. Thank you very much. So I'll give the floor now to the Honorable Netumbu Nandi Ndetwa. Deputy Prime Minister and Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of International Relations and Cooperation of Namibia, you have the floor, sir. Ma'am. And start again, please. Ma'am? Excellency, could you please start again? We're not hearing you. I think we're getting some technical difficulties at your end. Are you hearing me? Excellency, are you hearing me? Oh. 
I think we were experiencing some technical difficulties at your end. Can we can we move on to the next speaker and we'll, we'll come back to um, Her Excellency? I will then introduce the Honorable Rang Wing Cho, Minister of Ecology and Environment of China. You have the floor, Your Excellency. Honorable President uh, Yufa Ali, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends, hello everyone, first of all, on behalf of China, I would like to congratulate Guyana on its presidency of G77 plus China and thank the presidency for leading developing countries to actively respond to climate change during the special period of the COVID-19 pandemic. The unanticipated COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 has enlightened us that in the face of global crisis and challenges such as climate change, mankind is a community of shared future, only by pursuing harmonious coexistence of man and nature, sticking to the direction of green and low carbon development, and persisting in global cooperation to tackle climate change, can we achieve sustainable development for the future. So on September 22nd this year, President Xi Jinping solemnly announced at a general debate of the 75th UN General Assembly that China will increase its NDCs, adopt stronger policy measures, and strive to reach carbon dioxide peaking by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. This important announcement reflects China's firm determination to actively respond to climate change, take a green and low carbon development path, and promote the development of a community of shared future for mankind. Well, as the uh, most, uh, the biggest developing country in the world, China has always been attached great importance to climate change. By the end of 2019, China's carbon intensity had been reduced by 48.1% compared with 2005, and non-fossil energy accounted for 15.3%. Both indicators have exceeded the committed uh, 2020 targets ahead of schedule. Sales of the new energy vehicles account for more than half of the world's total. In the next step, China will unswervingly implement the national strategy of actively responding to climate change make stronger efforts to address climate change, accelerate low carbon transition of its energy mix, promote the development of low carbon industrial system, low carbon transport and low carbon buildings, accelerate the development of national carbon market and carry out carbon dioxide peaking actions and continuously improve adaptation capabilities to climate change. Developing countries are the groups most adversely affected by climate change. And they are also the most determined and important force in tackling climate change. G77 plus China, um, as the most important group of developing countries, should work together to make a louder voice and advance the global climate governance system toward fairer, more reasonable and win-win cooperation. So to this end, China would like to make three suggestions. First, we shall uphold the important position of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as the cornerstone of global climate governance, adhere to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, focus on implementing commitments in accordance with the institutional arrangement for nationally determined contributions and promote full and effective implementation of UNFCCC and Kyoto Protocol as well as Paris Agreement by all parties. Second, it should be highlighted that developed countries must earnestly assume their emission reduction responsibilities and funding obligations, make up for pre-2020 gap in greenhouse gas emission reduction as soon as possible, and propose a more ambitious NDCs target up to 2020. So, <coughs> developed countries 
must implement the financial support commitment of providing 100 billion US uh, dollars per year by 2020, and on the basis of this, new collective quantitative funding targets shall be proposed. Third, we call upon all parties to consider the practical difficulties faced by developing countries, strengthen adaptation to climate change, improve the resilience of developing countries to withstand climate risks, and provide sufficient funding, technology, and uh, capacity building support for developing countries to carry out climate change actions. China will always be committed to maintaining the solidarity of developing countries, unswervingly support G77 plus China in close cooperation and coordination, continue to promote South-South cooperation on climate change response and the development of Green Belt and Road Initiative, work with partners in developing countries to jointly promote green, resilient and sustainable recovery, and promote the comprehensive, effective, and continuous implementation of the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Amin Aslam, Minister for Climate Change of Pakistan. You have the floor. Let me first of all congratulate Guyana for uh, cha chairing the G77 plus China group and for convening this very important session on climate change. Um, I would like to say that uh, having heard the speeches, uh, we all understand and are living through a very disruptive time in our lives. This is probably the biggest disruption that our generation has seen. And the COVID pandemic, as it unfolds all, of, all over the world, has taught us two very important lessons. The first one is a warning. And the warning is that nature has got limits. And when we surpass those limits or push those boundaries or thresholds, nature will react. And that is a lesson that climate change is also teaching us for over a decade now. The second one is an opportunity. And the COVID opportunity lies in building back better and coming out of this crisis on a better pathway than what got us in there. A greener pathway and a pathway which can lead towards a nature-based recovery. So given, these, given this unprecedented situation, I would like to state that Pakistan uh, took the lead and, and set up what was called the green stimulus to, towards a, a better recovery from COVID. We based the green stimulus on two basic objectives. The first one was nature protection, and the second one was the generation of livelihoods or what we call green jobs. So all the activities that could match the two together, we reinforce them in our national policy doctrine, especially during the COVID era. We had a focus on, on three priority areas. The first one was the plantation of trees and protection of forests, which we call the 10 billion tree tsunami project. And that created a lot of jobs during the COVID era, amounting to around 84,000 green jobs during this COVID, COVID pandemic. The second one was called the Protected Area Initiative, which is enhancing the area of protected areas in Pakistan. And that also, again, in the, in, during the COVID era, managed to generate about 5,000 green jobs. And the third one is focused on what we call Clean Green Pakistan. And that's a drive towards bet, better waste management and urban sanitation. And it is, again, creating new avenues for green jobs. So all three combined are also using nature as a, as a part of the solution, and it, it, they are based on nature-based solutions. And all three of them are providing us with a recovery, which is also climate-compatible recovery. So this drive that we have gone into is, is something that is uh, adding on to our NDC. All these activities are much beyond what, what our NDC is, and raising the ambition of our action on the ground. In addition, during the COVID era, we also announced uh, a target for our renewable energy. And that was that by 2030, we want to shift to 60% clean energy in Pakistan. 
Also during the COVID era, we put our heads down and shifted from zero to quality fuels to zero five quality fuels. Again, bringing the emissions down for from the transport sector. And I think that all of these activities have pushed us into a direction which is climate compatible, which is protecting nature, and which is also creating new green jobs and a new green economy as we grow out of this COVID pandemic. But the one big question that remains is the financing question. And I've heard uh, the honorable colleague from Guyana talked about this, this issue of unlocking the financing for, for, for this uh, uh, intent and commitment shown by countries like Pakistan. The $100 billion of, of financing still remains a pipe dream that we've all uh, been seeing. It is still not on the ground. But I think that this is the right opportunity for that financing to get unlocked and for countries like Pakistan and other developing countries who are on a green pathway to recovery to be assisted in their endeavors. Uh, in our country, we have also created a platform called the Ecosystem Restoration Fund, which is meant to provide a platform for, for garnering our partnership with financing institutions. Already, uh, we have, uh, through the World Bank, procured about $180 million for nature financing in the green COVID, in the, in the COVID era. Need much more because our commitment, our a pathway is, is, is much, is demanding much more to be spent on this pathway. So I, I can assure you that we stand committed to the G77 and China group, but we also stand committed to having a better and more sustained climate financing unlock for countries like Pakistan. We are also engaged in what is called a debt for nature swap, which is, which is being discussed amongst the creditor countries who want to relax the, the debt for, for debtor countries like Pakistan to ease off in the, in the COVID era. And there is a dialogue going on and Pakistan has been chosen as one of, one of the pilot countries for this dialogue in which we are looking at uh, what is called a nature bond, which will be helping uh, us relax our debt, debt burden in lieu of us showing quantifiable performance on climate change and on biodiversity protection. I think this pilot project needs to be expanded very quickly and, and needs to be enlarged. And that is what can really help developing countries who are you know, uh, caught in this double trap of COVID and uh, debt payments that they have to do, uh, uh, which, are, which have become unprecedentedly stressed by the COVID pandemic. So I think this, uh, this is providing an opportunity for the developed countries to constructively engage with groups like G77 and China and make sure that the financing is available to put countries like Pakistan on a pathway towards a green recovery, towards a climate compatible recovery, and towards a recovery which is friendly for biodiversity protection also. There is a win-win-win available if we can commit to what we have already said and we, we can commit to providing what we had already promised, and that is the $100 billion of climate finance. This is the right time. This is the right opportunity. So I would urge the G77 and China group to make a, a, another passionate plea and a, another plea for the developed countries to honor this commitment. And as I said, this is an opportunity to provide a win-win-win benefit for countries like Pakistan to become climate compatible, biodiversity friendly, and also come out of the, the COVID era through a green recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We would like to go back to the Honorable Nitumbo Nandi Ndetwa, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of International Relations and Cooperation of Namibia. You have the floor. Dr. Mohamed Ali, President of Cooperative Republic of Guyana and the Vice President. Your Excellency, you taught Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Guyana. Honorable Ministers present, Your Excellencies. I want to thank 
Guyana in its capacity as chair of the group of 77 and China for organizing this event, an event that will allow participating countries to share their experiences in dealing with climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. These are some of the current ex existential and development challenges facing humanity today. At the outset, it is important to emphasize the urgent need for global solidarity and cooperation as global challenges cannot be addressed in isolation. With that being said, Namibia recognizes the urgent need for a new contract for nature through international action and solidarity. The scaling up of land restoration and nature-based solutions for climate change, climate action can surely be achieved. Namibia is also equally committed to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the Addis Ababa Action Plan. Thus, multilateral frameworks remain the guiding frameworks for Namibia in its decision and policy making processes, implementation, monitoring, and evaluations of projects and programs. Mobilization of resources for environmental sustainability is one of key priorities for the Namibian government. Through the cooperation and collaboration with multiple development partners, the government and the government of Namibia handed over 19 grants to the value of 85 million Namibian dollars to conservancies and community forests for climate change or for climate change projects under the community based natural resource management empower to adapt projects. In this regard, Namibia will continue to cooperate with different stakeholders with a view to learn from other countries. Environmental issues are cross-cutting and are at the center of sustainable development. Namibia recognizes that the protection of the environment is a shared global responsibility and thus forms part of its external policy. Moreover, Namibia reaffirms the urgent need for the United Nations decade on ecosystem restoration, which will start in 2021, which will build upon the progress made during the United Nations decade for deserts in the fight against desertification. Master Chairman, biological diversity is of immense importance to the Namibian people and the Namibian economy. Around 70% of Namibia's population depends on the natural base for their income, food, and medicinal needs, as well as for fuel and shelter. In conclusion, Master Chairperson, we are reminded that the United Nations Chapter points the way with its vision of people and countries living as good neighbors, defending universal values, and recognizing our common future. Namibia will continue to take the necessary actions to contribute to achieving the vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. Speaking was the Deputy Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Honorable Jenny Matundu, standing in for the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Honorable Netumbo Nandi Daifa, who could not attend this important meeting due to equal commitment. I thank you, Chairperson.
Thank you, Honorable Minister. We'll now move to the Honorable Anewa, Minister of Natural Resources and Environmental Conservation of Myanmar. You have the floor, Honorable Minister. To convey my sense of thanks to the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Dr. Mohamed. To what? 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 The 2030 agenda in the era of COVID 19. Today, let me change, along with COVID 19, comes as the biggest threat to humanity and our society socioeconomic development. It will take coherent effort to deal with both these challenges, and this battle cannot be fought low. Strengthening multilateral system underpinned by the principle of unity and solidarity of the group of G77 and China is needed, and we must demonstrate through collective actions at all levels and with all stakeholders. Mr. Chair, the Mawad settings up a clear institutional framework to mainstream climate change into all levels of national development plans and policies by legis legislating climate change policy and strategy in 2019. This is a long-term goal for us to be climate resilient, low-carbon society that is sustainable, prosperous, and inclusive for the well-being of present and future generations. We, as the least developed country, is facing risks to climate change and increasing vulnerability while facing natural disasters such as floods, droughts, cyclones, and landslides that are unprecedentedly increasing in terms of intensity and frequency. As a climate vulnerable country, loss and damage will be of utter importance for Myanmar. Therefore, adaptation actions are immediately needed and must be prioritized while reducing GHG emission for long-term goals in our NEC 2020. Nature-based solutions will be enhanced in both marine and terrestrial landscapes. National forest reference level to the UNFCCC and summary of REDD plus, which had been submitted and other key guiding documents for NDC 2020. We also hoped to enhance low carbon development by 2030. The share of new re renewable energy targets, solar and wind, will be increased from 2000 megawatt to 3070 megawatts, while the share of fossil fuels will be substantially decreased from the business as usual plan. By this means, we will el electrify the whole country in 2030, Mr. Chair. We recognize that a comprehensive post-pandemic economic recovery will require the integration of sound and environmentalist sustainable response and climate resilience. Such a response will allow us to build back, by, back better by taking advantage of opportunities for leapfrogging by capitalizing upon the potential for green investments in renewable energy and green infrastructure guided by the principles and standards of sustainable production and consumption, ensuring our nature natural environment is protected and continues to benefit as part of our national economic recovery efforts. No more hope that our global combined efforts will help meet the goal of the Paris Agreement to remain well below the 1.5 degree centigrade target and our fight against COVID-19. Let's unite to fight the battle against COVID-19 
and win the war on climate change. I once again thank the government of Guyana for the opportunity to speak in this forum and give my best wishes for its leadership role in the G77 for the UFCC, UNFCC negotiations. Thank you. Honorable Minister, we will now move to the Honorable Matsipo Ramakoi, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lesotho. Honorable Minister. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me at the outset to convey our gratitude to you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this important virtual flagship meet ministerial meeting of the Group 77 and China, and for your sterling work as you steered the work of the, our group for the past 10 months the Sutra stands ready to support you for the rest of your term. Our theme is very appropriate as this year marks the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, and we also begin the decade of action as we strive to realize the transformations necessary to address the challenges related to climate change, as well as our recovery from the adverse health and socioeconomic impacts of the new threat of COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Chairman, the COVID-19 has brought about a reversal of the hard end gains realized towards achieving sustainable development goals. It has in fact further exposed our vulnerabilities. Over the past decade, the Kingdom of Lesotho has joined efforts with the world to increase the climate change resilience and improve the well-being of the Basotho nation, in particular through mainstreaming climate change into our development programs and implementing concrete measures for adaption and climate risk reduction. Mitigation and low carbon development to achieve green growth. Mr. Chairman, in June 2018, Lesotho submitted a National Determined Contributions Report to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That is, was outlining initiatives to be undertaken to reduce greenhouse gases and adapt to climate change. It is Lesotho's intent to unconditionally lower a net greenhouse gas emission by 10% by 2030. To further push for an additional 25% greenhouse gas emission reduction on condition that external support, that is finance, investment, technology, development and transfer, and capacity building is made available to cover the full cost of implementing the adapt adaptation and mitigation actions. Mr. Chairman, I should mention that the National Strategic Development Plan has identified climate change as one of the key challenges that should be addressed and responded to in strategic manner using appropriate approaches. The Lesotho's National Climate Change Policy, therefore, is our tool for building climate change, resilience, and low carbon emission, a prosperous economy and environment. Mr. Chairman, just a few weeks ago, the government of Lesotho, in collaboration with, with its development partners, officially launched two projects, namely improving adap adaptive capacity of vulnerable and food insecure populations in Lesotho under the UNF's Triple C Adaption Fund and in Lesotho Renewable Energy 
and energy access project. Plans are underway to develop the uh, uh, develop and disseminate energy efficiency technologies as well as expand the rural electrification program using renewable energy sources, including the promotion of private sector involvement in the off-grid energy generation distribution. Other programs in the pipeline that will help us increase our ambition include investment in infrastructure for non-motorized transport and pedestrian traffic, efficient waste management, investment in fuel-efficient vehicles, cook stoves, and afforestations. Mr. Chairman, improving access and, and simplifying modalities for climate finance and, requis and requisite conditionalities will ensure that countries like Lesotho are on the track to maintaining a climate resilient pathway, thus bringing the attainment of the SDGs within reasonable reach. I wish to take this opportunity to express our gratitude and commend on development partners for at uh, both bilateral and multilateral levels for their continued support in the implementation of a number of ongoing fin fin finalized adaptation projects and programs countrywide. Mr. Chairman, as I conclude, it will be the remiss of me not to appreciate the work done by this group, the G77 and China, as it fully engages in the ongoing negotiations of the Quadrennial Comprehensive Poli Policy Review of the United Nations System Operational Activities. It is my fervent hope that it will pave the way to ensure that United Nations system plays a leading role in the implementation of Paris Climate Agreement and the Addis Ababa Action of Agenda, as well as the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development, and that it will provide a roadmap for, uh, for tackling our common development challenges, including economic recovery from the negative effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you for your attention. Honorable Minister, I would like to give the floor to the Honorable Luis Gallegos, Gallegos, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador. Honorable Minister. Thank you, Excellency Dr. Mohamed Yipran Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana and President of the Group of Seven in China. Honorable Kai Todd, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the International Co Cooperation of Guyana. Honorable Andres Aleman, Aleman, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Chile and President of COP25. Honorable Ministers, and other high level authorities, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the people and government of Guyana for the performance of its chairmanship of the Group of 77 in China in such a complex year, and for the convening of this ministerial meeting, which has confirmed the importance of combating adverse effects of climate change as an essential component to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, more than ever, when all our populations, and particularly those that are more poor and vulnerable, are facing the multidimensional impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected our world in an unprecedented manner, exacerbating existing challenges and creating new vulnerabilities. No country has been fully prepared to respond to this pandemic. But of course, our developing countries are suffering more, more to the bad effect of the current situation, result in the back sliding from all previous years of progress to achieve poverty eradication and sustainable development. In this context, the current long-term threat of climate change has even more potential to damage our livelihoods, safety, food, and health systems. In this regard, I would like to stress the COVID-19 pandemic has not only affected the economic and social dimensions of sustainable development, but also the environmental one. The international community has now sufficient scientific evidence to prove that the sustainable human intervention on ecosystems and biodiversity 
illegal trade or wildlife and other exploitation of our natural resources can increase the transmission of zoonotic and infectious diseases such as COVID-19. At the same time, the economic effect of the pandemic, financial resources for the protection of the environment, Employment has, ridden on, uh, has ri risen on public and private entities, limiting protection activities, research and innovation, while some negotiation processes have been postponed, including under the framework of the UNFCC, CBD, and other relevant fora. The good news is that many of our countries are conscious that we cannot run the risk of inaction because if we do, maybe it will be too late. Ecuador is one of those countries that are committed to continue to strengthen our efforts to undertake a low carbon development path with a view to achieve our internationally agreed objectives and goals, including inter alia on the 2030 agenda and Paris agreement under the convention. However, we cannot do it alone. And therefore it is imperative to ensure that all countries fully comply with their obligation and commitments according to all levels of government and sectors and society in order to be able to recover our economies while enhancing our resilience and adaptive capability. To achieve that, we also have to foster long-term clean investment, creating job opportunities and strengthening our infrastructure. Therefore, all current and future stimulus pa financial packages should incorporate the perspective of concrete contribution to our global climate goals. In spite of the multiple crises, Ecuador continues to work on the Climate Action Strategy. At the moment, our Ministry of Environment and Finance, together with other relevant entities and stakeholders, are working jointly in the development of the National Strategy for Climate Financing. These ministries are also working on other sustainable, low emissions and climate resilient initiatives, including the support with the support of the World Bank, with a view to develop an assessment of proposals for short, medium, and long-term environmental and climate action. Ecuador is also a lead, leading the regional readiness program supported by the Green Climate Fund that focuses on ensuring food security, health, and balanced nutrition and technological innovation in Latin America. The main goal of this project is to ensure a sustainable demand and supply food chains nationally and regionally, minimizing food waste and guaranteeing an adequate supply of food. We must build a strong institutional framework for climate action. The, the current reality gives us an opportunity to foster virtual challenges, changes in institutions at all levels. Digital technologies have the potential of providing access to information, knowledge, and exchange of experiences in the cost of, in a matter of seconds. But for that, we must address the threat of digital divide among countries, as well as misinformation, so that citizens may have reliable and factual data and make adequate choices. Development in countries we need now more than ever before the appropriate means of implementing financial resources, capability, capacity building, and technology, technology transfer. We need social solidarity and, uh, and cooperation. We need international financial systems and international funds and programs to align the global financial flows with countries needed and their climate plans and strategies. Middle income countries continue to require international support, solidarity, and to be considered eligible for humanitarian assistance, health and recovery programs for COVID-19 pandemic and resources to, co to combat climate change. We also require strong partnership. Climate action must permeate our society. The private sector, civil society, academia, communities, and households have the potential to help resolve better, stronger, and with resilience with, from this global crisis. Like COVID-19, climate change requires collective and individual consciousness and behavior change for common good. Bold actions, science, and innovation are essential. Potential synergies between climate action and SDGs abound, and therefore focusing on concrete measures for synergies, implementation, which will help inform and align both climate SDG processes at all levels, thus stimulating corresponding action for multiple stakeholders, especially in the decade of action. We can assess that preparedness and prevention are key to our actions for the sustainable recovery. Ecuador remains committed to combating the adverse effects of climate change, and to achieve sustainable development for our people, planet, and prosperity. 
leaving no one behind to know our planet behind. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, I would like to kindly ask you participants to keep your microphones muted until you're ready to take the floor. Thank you very much. I would like to now call on the Honorable Pernell Charles Jr., Minister of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change of Jamaica. Honorable Minister, you have the floor. Good morning to you, Chair, President Ali, Secretary General, Ministers, colleagues. Let me take the opportunity to congratulate and thank the government of Guyana, in particular, President Ali, for convening this meeting of minds around this most important subject. Colleagues, in 2009, when Jamaica completed the development of its National Development Plan, which we call Vision 2030, the world was in the midst of a global financial crisis. While the country was responding to the immediate emergencies at the time, we did not lose sight of the need to have a strategic plan that would allow Jamaica to operate in a dynamic and ever-changing global context while maintaining our momentum towards achieving sustainable and inclusive development in alignment with the 2030 agenda. Today, 11 years later, and 10 years before our first long-term goal is to be met, we find ourselves again in the midst of a global crisis that not only has placed Jamaica, but many other countries in the world on high alert status, mobilizing immediate disaster response and having to take tough decisions to protect the lives, livelihood, and well-being of our citizens and macroeconomic stability. The pandemic has also exposed again pre-existing and new vulnerabilities threatening to reverse the social, economic, and environmental progress that we have made during the last decade. It would be very easy uh, to abandon our long-term vision and deal with the realities of today. After all, development in the Caribbean has been marked by the inadequacies and limited options granted to us since achieving independence in 1962 here in Jamaica. However, we have never walked away before from any challenge, and in fact, it is our belief that under these disruptive conditions, we can create unprecedented policy, regulatory, social, and also economic change if the next decade. Notably, colleagues, the success of the SDGs and 2030 agenda is dependent on our ability to financially support policy transformations. Therefore, the stimulus package that I've put in place now and how they will be utilized and perhaps the most important indicator or are the most important indicators to predict the future fate of the 2030 agenda. Jamaica continues to be affected by challenges triggered by the vulnerabilities and external economic shocks, which include the impact of natural disasters, the impacts of climate change, and a fiscally constrained economic situation. We are challenged to implement policies that will trigger fast and sustained progress towards the goals in a context of limited fiscal space. So during this unprecedented time, uh, Jamaica has taken some bold steps that will help us to stay on track to our Vision 2030, our National Development Plan. Firstly, uh, we were able to mobilize US $25 million, the largest fiscal stimulus in our country's history. Um, secondly, we have swiftly put together a national COVID-19 economic recovery task force to guide the process of rebuilding Jamaica. And thirdly, we have ensured uh, that we continue to prioritize climate action. 
um, and we are preparing our long-term low carbon and climate resilient strategy, the 2050 pathway. Jamaica as a member of the G77 and China and the AOSIS negotiation blocks has continuously increased our ambition towards meeting our commitments under the Paris Agreement. Indeed, we have become leaders of ambition and we have taken on every opportunity to lead the climate finance debate on the global stage. Further, we have produced a technically sound um, and policy-based NDC proposing ambitious new energy targets and also expanding our sectoral coverage to critical sectors like land use, land use change and forestry to help reduce carbon emissions, increase adaptation and build resilience. Excellencies and colleagues, pivoting to the next decade and towards a low carbon development pathway requires a long-term planning and vision. And we must challenge ourselves to think bigger than ourselves. We, of course, cannot ignore the linkages between climate action and climate finance. We need urgent access to financing that is equitable, that is timely, scalable, and flexible. We cannot stress enough that we need a transformation of the global financial system. In closing, Jamaica would like to reiterate our ambition. By 2030, we see Jamaica as a country having a vibrant, sustainable, and resilient economy, society, and environment. A high level of human capital development greater opportunities and access to these opportunities for the population, and a high level of human security. We will continue to work assiduously towards achieving our vision as we create the society we hope for and deserve, a place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. I thank you, my colleagues. Wish you all the best for the rest of our forum. So I will like to give the floor to the Honorable Abdullah Shahid, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Maldives. You have the floor, Honorable Minister. President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, His Excellency Bharat, the Vice President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, His Excellency Hugh Hilton Todd, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Guyana, Excellencies, distinguished uh, colleagues. I would like to begin by thanking you, Mr. Chair, for convening this uh, very important event. Let me also take this opportunity to commend you for the exemplary leadership of the Group of 77 and China in this most challenging year. Our group this year has many important areas of focus, which includes climate change, poverty eradication, inequality, women and youth empowerment. But today, COVID-19 has brought the whole world to a standstill. And the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic cannot be overstated. With the IMF estimated potential global GDP contraction of 5% in 2020, the economic impacts of COVID-19 were unavoidable for many small states, despite having avoided high levels of infection. For the Maldives, early measures put in place to contain the pandemic including the closing of our borders on 27th March and the shutdown of global tourism rendered us a no-income country almost overnight. Taking advantage of our unique one island, one resort set up to facilitate physically distancing, we opened our borders in mid-July. However, several international travel restrictions and the fear surrounding the pandemic 
continue to hinder tourist arrivals to the Maldives. Thus, our GDP is expected to contract by as much as 30% in 2020. We know that no country has been spared from this pandemic. But the stark reality is that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected seeds such as the Maldives by exacerbating existing vulnerabilities, including climate change, trade imbalances, enormous debt burdens, and the digital divide. Mr. Chairman, our targets for mitigating the impacts of climate change and achieving the sustainable development goals that seemed ambitious only a year ago may now appear unattainable. The pandemic has slowed or in some cases, reversed the progress made towards achieving 2030 agenda. Although the pandemic poses an unprecedented challenge, climate change remains the most serious, the potentially irreversible long-term threat to humanity. When it comes to meeting the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal of the Paris Agreement, failure is not an option. As such, the Maldives welcomes G77's call for more ambitious climate action to get us back on track and submit updated and more ambitious nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. Given our unique vulnerabilities to effects of climate change, the Maldives is highly committed to building back better, greener and bluer from today's economic challenge. The Maldives can only reach the ambitions and necessary goals set forth in the 2030 Agenda and the Samoa pathway with access to adequate, predictable and sustainable finance that comprehends the unique burdens and risks we face. The financial resources we need exist in the world today. We only need the markets that allocate these resources to recognize that the proper management of risk requires sufficient financing for sustainable and climate-friendly development. It must consider the multidimensional vulnerability index. I therefore urge our group to intensify our efforts to make the financial institutions and development banks become more flexible in their approach to concessional financing. Embracing the, their role in creating a pathway to sustainable and climate-friendly recovery. In addition, we call upon our partners, the developed countries, to fulfill their commitment to provide the 100 billion US dollar per year in climate financing to developing countries. Mr. Chair, distinguished colleagues, this pandemic presents us with an opportunity. It is an opportunity to recommit our collective ideals and work together to achieve the SDGs, fight climate change, and help the most vulnerable countries to recover and build back better. During the high-level week of the UN General Assembly, President Sawley emphasized that we must keep the spirit of multilateralism alive if we are to build back better from this pandemic. It is up to us to harness our scientific knowledge and technology to implement sustainable and restorative development strategies to secure our planet and its resources for generations to come. Indeed, our obligations under the SDGs and Paris Agreement demand that we can, that we make the most of this opportunity. I thank you. Honorable Minister, I will now like to give the floor to His Excellency Sultan Ben Said al Mukarai, State Minister for Foreign Affairs, State of Qatar. You have the floor, Your Excellency. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellency, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we would like at the outset to express our sincere thanks to the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for convening this meeting. We commend 
it for its uh, appreciated effort and successful leadership in chairing the group of 77 and China under exceptional and unprecedented circumstances. Excellency, given the importance of the comprehensive international response to address the effect of climate change, the state of Qatar has played a pioneering role in the international efforts in this field. To this end, His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, the Emir of the State of Qatar, pledged at the Climate Action Summit held in September 2019 a contribution by the State of Qatar in the amount of 100 million US dollars to support the small island development, development states and the least development countries to tackle the climate change, especially since those countries bear the burden of the climate change. We take this opportunity to recall that Qatar Fund for Development is currently designed disbursement mechanism to disperse the fund in order to address the challenges related to climate change in those countries. As a part of our efforts to channel investment toward cleaner options, the state of Qatar is seeking to regulate carbon pricing as a mean to reduce the emission. The state of Qatar has adopted scientific strategic to, pre to preserve the environment and reduce dependence on hydrocarbon energy. In this context, we are proud to announce that the state of Qatar has recently ratified Doha Amendment of Kyoto Protocol to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Dear Excellencies, the state of Qatar is looking forward to hosting the fifth United Nations Conference on the least developed countries to, to be held in Doha from 23rd to 27th, January 2022. We trust that the new program of action for the next decade will provide an important opportunity to support the efforts of LDCs in addressing the shortcomings and challenges facing them, including the climate-related cha challenges. In conclusion, we affirm that the state of Qatar will continue to work and cooperate with the international community toward mitigating the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you. I'd like to hand the mic now to our moderator who will take us through the second phase of session one, and that is Ambassador Neil Pierre, coordinator of the G77 group at China from Guyana. Ambassador Neil Pierre, I hand it over to you now. Hello to everyone. Now, with all protocol observed, I would like us to move uh, quickly in the interest of time into our main focus for the second segment of session one. Our focus now will be to drill down into some of the salient issues that have been so well described for us by their excellencies in all of the presentations we've just heard. Let me just uh, contextualize uh, some of what, we've, what we see as the main takeaways. First of all, we've heard that there's an unabated rise of glo in global warming, despite what re recent uh, statistics show of temporary reductions in greenhouse gas emissions due to the COVID-19 impact. We've also heard that millions have been thrown into unemployment, poverty, hunger, food insecurity, and many other issues particularly in developing countries. And we've heard of the need for a major reset, which perhaps has begun, but may need to be accelerated. With this general context, I'd like to pose three fundamental questions, which we will address in the, in the preceding discussion. First of all, given all that has been said and given that 
The international normative frameworks are very well established against which we can address these challenges. What then is required to meaningfully deal with the existential threat of climate change while saving lives in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic? My second question of a, of a general nature and to bring us into a discussion is what actions are needed to put us back on track for the 2020, for achieving the 2020 Sustainable Development Agenda. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Agreement, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, and all of the normative, international normative frameworks that we know exist. And thirdly, we know that policies, resources, partnerships are considered key elements in our response. So what then are, are the other requirements, particularly in view of the reset that we mentioned? To take us through this exa a further examination of these issues, we will first hear an address by Ms. Patricia Espinosa, the Executive Director of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Secretariat. Please uh, play her address. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. The last six months have been a nightmare for many throughout the world. COVID-19 has altered lives, economies, and the nature of business on every continent. What was once theoretical, a global emergency in our lifetimes, has now happened. It came without warning, it came rapidly, and we were unprepared. But the climate change crisis did not disappear with the pandemic. This August marked the 428th consecutive month with temperatures above the 20th century average. September was the warmest September since global record keeping began in 1880. And NASA predicts that 2020 may be our hottest year. Many saw a silver lining when they heard emissions were down a few months ago. But unfortunately, those numbers are returning to pre-pandemic levels. Instead, the sliver of hope lies elsewhere. The recognition that the convergence of these two global crises has opened a window of opportunity, not simply to recover from a virus, but to build forward, to build cities and communities that are safe, healthy, green and sustainable. I believe there are three keys to success if we are to get back on track addressing climate change while also building forward. Members of the G77 and China will be instrumental in leading this work. First, we need a recommitment to multilateralism. In this, the 25th anniversary of the United Nations, we are reminded we already have the international multilateral framework in place to build forward properly, as well as address our climate challenges. The reason humanity has made such incredible progress over the last few centuries, despite wars and emergencies, is because we know we have proof that an international cooperative approach is not only the way to address global catastrophes, but it's the only way to build a better, more peaceful and more just world. Second, we need a recommitment to climate change by national leaders. Just as we saw prior to the Paris Agreement, and especially now, as we enter the last quarter of 2020. In the five years since the Paris Agreement, we've seen a retreat by some national leaders, both with respect to fulfilling their commitments under the agreement, and in the clear need to work collaboratively with other nations and civil society to boost climate action for the future. There is a clear division between urgency and response, a disconnect between those throughout the world calling for more urgent climate action and what national leaders collectively have achieved thus far. Delay in early 2020 is somewhat understandable. The pandemic has diverted energy, attention and resources from climate change. 
But as this group has noted, the climate emergency existed long before the pandemic. The pandemic simply exacerbated that emergency and efforts to address it. Lack of leadership was evident before COVID-19. This was clear a year ago in Madrid, when parties, while making some gains, left work incomplete. This occurred despite clear calls for progress, amidst protests outside the negotiation rooms in several countries and throughout social media. Compare that to what we saw from these same nations five years ago in advance of the Paris Agreement, where we saw the convergence of three important elements. A clearly expressed public need, strong, willing, and informed leadership by major emitters, and a positive high level of engagement of parties about the issues and the process. If we're to get back on track, avoid the coming climate emergency that some predict to be far, far more devastating than the pandemic, national leaders must remembrance the spirit we saw prior to the Paris Agreement. My third key to success is an extension of the second. We need nations to assume the moral leadership to complete unfinished tasks while working with other nations to significantly and rapidly boost climate ambition. In many meetings, we've had both before the pandemic and in the first half of 2020, ministers from many nations pledged to maximize progress and ambition on climate change, to speed things up. This is admirable, but ministers must ensure that their pledge reaches all levels of decision-making to complete outstanding work and ensure that COP26 is the success it must be. Finishing the work is about more than completing a list of tasks. It's about building trust in the climate regime. Trust only comes through honoring commitments in getting the work done and following words with actions. Nowhere is this truer than with respect to the NDCs, the National Climate Action Plans. Under the Paris Agreement, nations are due to submit new or revised climate plans in 2020. This due date remains unchanged. These plans are submitted only once every five years. If nations delay yet another five years to table stronger plans, our window of opportunity to address climate change will likely be closed. In fact, the NDCs can provide the central outlet for nations as they build forward and plan their post-pandemic response to truly make this a transformative moment towards a greener and cleaner future. Dear members of the G77 and China, we cannot allow COVID-19 take the focus of the climate emergency that threatens all nations. However, each can be addressed by building forward, by re-embracing multilateralism, by honoring commitments under the Paris Agreement and continuing to build trust in the climate regime. We are at a crucial point in history these are difficult times, but never have we had such an opportunity to shape the future like we do right now. I still have optimism that we can achieve success, but it will take an incredible amount of work and it will take an incredible amount of leadership. I call upon all of you to show it. When the history of these times is told, let them say, that this is the point where humanity recognizes that it is not the planet that is in peril. Earth will always survive, but humanity's future upon it. And recognizing this, humanity acted. For that story to be told, we cannot delay our duties. We must begin now. We must begin here, and we must do it together. Thank you.
experts and professionals who will share their knowledge and experience with us on this framing uh, discussion. Uh, before I invite them to take the floor in the order in which they appear on the program, I would like to invite Dr. Paul Oquist, Minister and Private Secretary for National Policies of Nicaragua, to take the floor to deliver a statement. He'll be followed by the uh, discussions on our program, and then we will open the floor for discussion and for interact for an interactive discussion with a list of speakers that I already have. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much. The novel coronavirus and COVID-19 demonstrate how unprepared we are to confront our high risk threat and how little we invest politically and economically in avoiding them, which also applies to the threat of climate change. The degree of disruption of our lives, societies and economies of the novel coronavirus and the disease COVID-19 is greater than 9-11, the 2007-2009 financial crisis, and the subsequent Great Recession combined. Yet the disruption of the coronavirus is small, transient, and recoverable compared to the total permanent and irreversible damage of the disruption of the ecosystems and synergies between them that maintain life on planet Earth, including the critical variable temperature. We all agree, I'm sure, that confronting climate change is just as important as COVID-19 and must have a high priority. As a matter of fact, the re recovery from the economic damage that has been caused by the, the lockdowns and the other measures that closed economies and, 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 and uh, and cause the, the disruption of life completely, this uh, recovery needs to restill hope and uh, confidence in the future. One of the ways to do that would be if COPE 26 firmly establishes the uh, IPCC goals of uh, minus 45% of uh, emissions by 2030 and net zero emission society by 2050. This would open up the hope that we can avoid the worst consequences of climate change. As a matter of fact, we must leave Glasgow with COP26 with climate recovery and economic recovery combined as the top priority, because if they're not the top priority, they will not sail. They will sink in a sea of multiple competing priorities because there's too many priorities on the table these days. So this must enjoy the top priority. With regard to how to do this, we must remember that the top 10 societies in terms of emissions, the top 10 countries, represent 72% of the emissions. The battle to reduce the emissions will be decided among the top 10. The 100 countries with the lowest emission, we account for 3%. No matter what we do, we will not tip the scale one way or the other. In Nicaragua, we're 0.03% of the emissions, yet we're going from 26% renewable energy to 90% uh, renewable energy in 2023. We're now at 77% renewable energy. Does this change the world scheme of things? Not in the slightest, but we do it because we're responsible citizens and because it's in our interest too, because we are replacing hydrocarbon imports with uh, our, uh, our, our, our water, our sunshine, our steam from our volcanoes, the biomass from our agriculture. And so this is a benefit of our, of our ex uh, exchange, of our uh, terms of exchange also, our balance of payment. I wish to congratulate the People's Republic of China and its president, Mr. Xi Jinping, for having announced in the General Assembly China's 2030 commitment and 2060 commitment. There's nine more a large 
uh, country and with regard to the emissions that need to be brought in line. And the UK and Italy would be well advised to concentrate on that in terms of having accomplishments with regard to ambition. The other major issue needed to make COP26 a success is finance, which was mentioned by several other of the uh, countries, including uh, Pakistan. The $100 billion commitment first made in uh, first made in, uh, in Copenhagen must be honored. Secretary General uh, Antonio Gutierrez is aware of this and is working hard to achieve this. The UK mission includes Mr. Mark Carney, who is eminently well placed to be able to mobilize resources. I wish to thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to address G77, whose role in achieving these goals is absolutely essential, whose role is absolutely essential. Thank you very much. I thank, I thank the minister for his intervention. We will now proceed to hear the presentations from our discussants. I would first like to introduce and call on Dr. Yuba Sakona, Special Advisor for Sustainable Development at the South Center. Can I ask all others to please mute their microphones? Dr. Sakona, you have the, mic the floor. Okay, Excellencies, Honorables, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, conversation. In the beginning, I thought that as an uh, vice chair of IPCC, I will focus on the science. And after listening uh, the uh, statement of President uh, Jatgeo, and I decided not. A lot has been said, and then a powerful statement has been made with a clear understanding of the problem, the issues, and then what uh, to be done. And as the session is framing the discourse, it's important to have at least a narrative, and then what the narrative uh, that will be, and I think uh, what emerged, what I hear, and at that start with uh, the uh, first speaker, President uh, Jack Deo, that solidarity, solidarity should be the framing of the narrative of the uh, the framing of the, the the discourse, because solidarity is a powerful concept, a powerful notion. It's beyond. It's much more powerful than partnership. It's much more powerful than. Uh, uh, cooperation, it's, it's encompassed all, all of them. Why solidarity is important? Because G77 and China is made of variety of countries with different circumstances, with different capacity capabilities, with different perspectives, and then we need to take all on down and board. And it seemed to me also that in that juncture, there is uh, three key elements we need to bring together, that is development, sustainable development and climate. Uh, the emphasis is made on climate and sustainable development, less on development. Development is our starting point. And then the key question, when we start with development agenda, oh, this is our own business, day-to-day -day business. And then just that will drive different action. And then how we make development more sustainable. And that because sustainable development is an aspiration. It goes beyond the G77 in China, because the global universally is an aspiration. And then in that context, the process of moving from development to more sustainable development is much more important than the destination. And then how we make that compatible with climate. And then that is how we bring the three together. And then by bringing the solidarity in that concept, and then we need to emphasize on four main critical elements, and then those has been indicated in some of the talks. First one, and then this is what has been at the origin of this conversation, this leadership. Leadership is critical, it's fundamental, but not all kind of leadership. It's a system leadership that is very important in order to be able and then to mobilize the various leadership in different clusters on the policy, policy, policy aspect, on the science, on the practice. Leadership is very critical, it's fundamental. 
And then second element is institutions, because we do have the secretary, the presidency of G77 China, and then to bring some of those discussions, but we need to go beyond as we are in a concrete actions. And then we need to find a way of, uh, uh, of uh, what kind of innovative institution we need to bring on board. And then the third element that has been also uh, alluded and that will be discussed, that's related to resources. Resources, not only financial resources, is, is also human resources. If we look at the wider range of countries, we do have within G77 in China, a lot of resources that is uh, on hand, human resources, capacities, and other, and so on and so forth. And then the third element, the fourth element, much more critical and fundamental, it's bringing together the short-term imperative and the long-term imperative. And that is how we bring together national development imperative and some emerging problems such as the COVID and then with the climate is a long-term imperative, sustainable development, that is a long-term imperative. And then those are some of the elements I just want to bring in to the discussion. And unfortunately, I have limited time, but I can elaborate on them during the uh, Q&A question. Thank you. I thank you, Dr. Sukona. I think you made maximum and optimal use of the time available to you. Very, very, very excellent uh, points indeed. Uh, allow me now to introduce and, and, and welcome Ms. Anna Wellenstein, the Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean, Sustainable Development Global Practice of the World Bank Group. Ms. Wellenstein, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And on, uh, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, guest colleagues, it's a real privilege to be here today and be able to speak at this event um, under the chairmanship of Guyana. As we've discussed, and we've heard from many of our speakers, um, even before the pandemic, we were quite off on our development and climate targets. And now the limited progress we've made, we're seeing set back and, and in jeopardy. Uh, just to draw some attention for the first time in over 20 years, we are seeing extreme global poverty on the rise this year. Um, the disruption of uh, COVID pandemic compounds, the challenges we were also already facing in terms of conflict and climate change and addressing global poverty. In Guyana, as around the globe, the pandemic, as you know well, has not only been a health crisis, stretching public health systems, but also an economic crisis. Reduced productivity, loss of life, business closures, trade disruptions, they're all taking their toll. And recovering from the pandemic will be an immense challenge, but all countries, including Guyana, have this once in a generation chance to set themselves on a path to sustainable, inclusive and resilient recovery. So this downturn we're seeing is an opportunity as well to pivot. So Ambassador Pierce, you asked earlier, what's needed to put us back on track. So making the right investments today can unlock short-term gains, jobs and economic growth, as well as deliver long-term benefits for people, <clears throat> excuse me, including decarbonization and resilience. So we heard from some of our illustrious speakers earlier, really good examples of how some countries are endeavoring down this path. So let me shed a little, some few further ideas on how we can all work towards getting on that path. So investments in climate resilient infrastructure, adopting climate smart practices and technologies as well as improving the governance and strengthening institutions are prerequisites for getting on that transformational path. Importantly, and we cannot forget, moving to a low carbon economy can provide real growth and real job opportunities. So this isn't an either or situation. Importantly, there is no vaccine coming for climate change, but by making sure that recovery is sustainable and resilient, governments can help their citizens better prepare for other crises improving drought management, building cohesive communities, strong coastal zone planning, adopting uh, risk financing instruments, among a host of other actions are all critical to reducing current and future risks and productivity losses. And by making sure that that recovery is inclusive and just, governments can address the inequalities and exclusions that are all too well known. They can support workers through an economic transformation and protect the most vulnerable. These efforts will also necessitate, as we've heard, the collective working to optimize multilateral support. Financing from IFIs like the World Bank Group can and should be combined with that of other partners like GEF and GCF to create an enabling environment to attract more private finance. One of our colleagues mentioned that the funding is out there. How can we be a platform to bring in that private finance? 
To immediately respond to the pandemic, the World Bank Group's emergency response operations have already reached 100 developing countries, home to 70% of the world's population. And we've committed to spend $160 billion over the next 15 to 18 months to respond to health, economic, and social uh, shocks that the countries are facing. With this support, we aim to help countries meet their urgent needs and also to reduce the trade-offs that they may see between development goals, short-term response, and longer-term development goals, including climate change. While at the same time, we assure that climate change is mainstream through all these actions we're taking today. So going ahead, we know that countries will not get a second opportunity to build back better. So we want to do all that we can to help them respond to not only the crisis today, but the future shocks. Thank you very much for the chance to speak. I thank Ms. Wellenstein for her uh, presentation. In the interest of time, and we've already exceeded our time, so let me move quickly to our third and final uh, speaker in this segment uh, before we come into the interactive discussion. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Deb Bhattacharya from the Center for Policy Dialogue and Southern Voices. Dr. Bhattacharya, you have the floor. May I also ask uh, that all microphones be muted, please? There is a microphone that's open. Ms. Castro. Dr. Bajacharya, my microphone was muted and I apologize for the interruption. Uh, it's my pleasure to now give you the floor. Please unmute your microphone. We can hear you now. Oh, it's muted again, I'm sorry. Dr. Bajacharya, we cannot hear you. It's not from me. Oh, I'm not sure what is happening. Your, your microphone is being muted and unmuted. Right now you're unmuted, so please go ahead with your, uh, it's again muted. May I ask for some technical support from our IT colleagues? There's an issue of muting and unmuting of Dr. Bhattacharya's microphone. It's happening from the host. It's happening from the yes. host, not from me. You're, we can hear you now, yes. Okay. Thank you, thank I'm sorry about thank that. You very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, it's my unique privilege to be part of this very high-level proceedings. Uh, I know that time is scarce, so all protocols observed, let me proceed with my points. Um, first of all, I would definitely like to compliment uh, Guyana for its leadership for this meeting and all the high-level speakers who have spoken here today. Uh, since the ultimate objective uh, is to prepare a communique out of these proceedings, let me make a couple of points over here, which may be considered for inclusion in the proceedings. I speak on behalf of the least developed countries as a member of the UN Committee for Development Policies and looking after the LDC's interest. Let me take that forward a bit more. As you know that most of the least developed countries, the 47 of them, a majority of them are climate affected countries and they suffer from various kinds of vagaries of nature, as I call it, they are punished by geography and you know, chastised by history in that way. So what has happened that in all these countries, they are facing rising seawater level, frequent uh, tornadoes and storms and floods, erratic rainfall, a, and a high, high and sometimes very high rainfall, and increased salinity, deforestation, and all these things. So I think it is important that we highlight the special case of these least developed countries in the communique regarding their challenges concerning uh, the climate-induced, you know, challenges uh, over there. But the most important part of it is that these challenges have aggravated because of COVID-19. All our studies are showing that the pre-existing crisis uh, vulnerabilities of the least developed countries not only have exacerbated, but also new forms of vulnerabilities have in, um, emerged, which are also con uh, creating climate-induced, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of uh, manifestations. So the, the, if you look at these countries during the last six months, the country I come from, Bangladesh, we have experienced floods, we have experienced typhoon Anfan. If you look at Sahel, they have been also experiencing the, the, the various kinds of 
uh, you know, uh, locust attack, floods and other things. East Africa was equally affected by that. Most of the LDCs over there, and not to talk about the small and island states in the Pacific, the Vanuatu in particular, they have been all facing all these problems over there. So the second point I would like to have it highlighted in the communique is that the, the pre-existing vulnerabilities of the LDCs have exacerbated and created further severe conditions on climate-induced dimensions over there. Now, what are the third point is that what you do with this? You see, the, all the countries are facing fiscal challenges. They have a, a constraints with the fiscal space, and they're making very serious trade-offs, policy trade-offs in this case. And climate at this moment, climate-related issues are not really at the, at, the, at the front line. It is more the social security of other natures, health, education, and other emergencies are very much there. So in the absence of much more flexibility in the fiscal space, the trade-offs are being done to the disadvantage of the so-called Green Deal or whatever, building back better in the green way. So the, the, the opportunity for building back better in the green on a greener path, however may sound theoretically good, in practice, in reality check, it is not happening in the countries. So what I'm to do, uh, the last point I want to make over here is that there are climate finance opportunities which have been set up by the community, the global community over the years. Take, for example, the Global Environment Fund. There is a special LDC fund over there, and these LDCs are not being able to adequately address, uh, access them. Also because of the supply and demand gaps over there, the money is too little for others. And second, also the processing itself is also quite challenging for all these uh, countries over there. There is, of course, the system for transparent allocation of resources, the STAR program to uh, support in a project preparation and others, but it also still turned out to be not, um, not adequate at this moment. The Green Climate Fund is also there. And we, what we see, the allocation for the least developed countries are not necessarily commensurate with the with the total mobilization which are taking place globally. So transparency on that, data information on that, and particularly COVID-related new energy in that has become very, very important in, in under the circumstances. These issues are particularly important for the 12 graduating LDCs which are coming out, which may not be remain eligible for the LDC fund in the future. So the, uh, I would expect that the communique would highlight not only the LDC concerns, they were the the exacerbation of their challenges in in the context of COVID, and also in terms of the financial issues, which are at this moment a real constraint given the uh, the fiscal stress which all these countries are feeling are facing. Thank you very much for listening to me. I thank Dr. Bhattacharya for his presentation and for the words of wisdom. Uh, distinguished uh, delegates. We will now proceed to the interactive portion of our, of our session. And I apologize to my moderate, the moderator who will succeed me because we are taking up some of his time. And I now have four speakers on our list, on my list. I would like to declare that the list is closed uh, and we will proceed in the, in the order in which they are, they are listed. I'd like to call on His Excellency Ambassador Mohamed Idris, the permanent representative of of Egypt to the United Nations uh, to address us. May I ask also that we be very strict with uh, keeping the time limit that is allowed. You have the floor, Excellency. Thank you very much, Brother Ambassador Neil. And allow me first to recognize and appreciate His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Guyana, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Guyana, and His Excellency, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Esteemed participants, allow me at the outset to express our deep appreciation to the government of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for convening this very important meeting in such a very timely manner. Our meeting today takes place at a juncture where the world faces unprecedented challenges. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our economic and social activities, putting our joint efforts to achieve the long-sought sustainable development at risk. It is of the utmost importance to see this opportunity to reposition climate change at the very center of our global agenda in the context of building back better. In this regard, I would like to emphasize the following three points very briefly. First, climate ambition and the climate finance. For developing countries, ambition in climate action cannot be pursued without enabling climate finance. 
the latest estimates put the finance gap for implementing the full scope of African nationally determined contributions at US dollars three trillion. We need to ensure that developing countries have access, can mobilize, and ensure delivery of climate finance. Second, COVID-19 experiences lessons for combating climate change. Undoubtedly, the continuing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic have been more disproportionately felt in the Global South. It's important that our response to the climate crisis does not take a back seat. We need to redouble our efforts in ensuring that the level of ambition in climate action respond to our heightened challenges in a comprehensive approach that indulges, that includes mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation. In Egypt, we are cognizant of the link between COVID-19 and the climate crisis. We are pursuing efforts to minimize the effects of the pandemic and ensure that a swift and fast recovery is achieved without having to relegate our climate priorities or action as secondary priority. Thirdly, ecosystem-based approaches to climate change. Egypt believes in the interconnection between climate change and the protection of biodiversity. Over-exploitation of nature and its biodiversity is one of the key factors behind the spread of new diseases. A coherent approach will ensure that climate change impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems are reduced and that biodiversity and ecosystems can contribute to climate adaptation and mitigation and to restoration of degraded lands. Uh, to conclude, in that regard, Egypt launched an initiative during the CPD COP 14 in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt in 2018. It aims to guide and support continued countries to meet in a synergetic and integrated manner their objectives and commitments under the three Rio conventions. Uh, at the end, Mr. Chairman, I would like to reconfirm Egypt's appreciation to the initiative of Guyana to hold this important meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. And thank you for uh, observing some at the time limit. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with the following requests. And as I said, the, the list is now closed uh, for further intervention. We have a request from the Deputy Minister for International Cooperation of Liberia. I will give you the floor for next, Mr. Uh, Deputy Minister, followed by the Permanent Representative of India and the Director of uh, National Hydrometeorology Service for uh, Azerbaijan. And we will close with the permanent representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations in that order. Deputy Minister, you have the floor. The Deputy Minister, please, can you un Okay, uh, and may I ask that you be brief, please, minute, Deputy Minister, you have the microphone. I want to extend on behalf of His Excellency Dr. George Manawir, President of the Republic of Liberia. The government and people of Liberia warm sentiment as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. I would also like to congratulate His Excellency Hugh Su, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Guyana and Chair of the Commission on the 7th for 2020 for his enthusiastic contribution to the work of the Group of 77 and for enabling steering in affairs. Thanks to the Committee of Experts of the Paris Coral Trust Fund, the PGTF, for soft soft cooperation for the expeditious handling of the operations of the form. The project implemented on the form symbolize the true essence of how developing country on the framework of the soft soft cooperation can facilitate in the soft. Also want to acknowledge the, the effort by the committee to expand the form and further entertain the hope that the multiplier effect can be felt 
across its membership. The PGTF is a fund established for the purpose of supporting economic and technical cooperations among developing countries in order to achieve national and collective self-reliance. The 56th anniversary of the group provides a unique opportunity to further reflect the idea of principles of the group. Such reflection should enhance the group's solidarity. In conclusions, on behalf of the government of Liberia, I would like to renew Liberia commitment and support to the ideas and principle of the group and look forward to Liberia participation in the impending soft soft summit. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Minister of Liberia for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. T.S. Tiramurti, Permanent Representative of India to the United Nations. May I ask all others to please mute their microphone? Deputy Minister, may I ask you to please mute your microphone? Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. Ambassador, okay, thank you. We weren't hearing you. Yeah. Can you speak? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, perfect. We thank can hear. the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for organizing this important G77 event. The title of this session is Framing the Discourse. Let me at the outset underline that the discourse has already been framed. That is why the Climate Change Convention is called the Framework Convention. The Framework Convention is being called so precisely to frame the discourse, to frame our responsibilities, to frame our actions, and to frame the results of our actions. That is precisely the reason why India has consistently underlined the importance of respecting this framework convention, which all our countries have negotiated and therefore collectively own. Therefore, in the era of COVID, the most important guarantee we have is for countries to implement faithfully the Framework Convention, the Paris Agreement, and the Financing for Development Framework to fight climate change and bring about low-carbon development. However, during COVID, it is a matter of regret that countries are using the pandemic to try to push ideas and decisions which undermine not just the Paris Agreement, but even other conventions. COVID-19 should not be an excuse for undermining conventions, but in fact, should spur countries, particularly developed countries, to implement their obligations to achieve Agenda 2030. Consequently, whatever activity we undertake in the era of COVID and beyond should be convention plus and not convention minus. We call on countries to undertake activities to strengthen convention plus activities on the path of promoting low carbon development. India has not only shown its resolve, but has also undertaken path-breaking initiatives, which I would term as Convention Plus. I refer here to the International Solar Alliance, spearheaded by our Prime Minister, which was a bold initiative for enhanced innovative climate action. 88 countries have now signed the International Solar Alliance, and India has pledged US dollars 1.7 billion so far for solar energy projects. In a similar direction, we have also pioneered the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure and other initiatives, including during COVID, under South-South cooperation. I thank you. I thank the permanent representative of India to the United Nations for his statement. I now invite the Director of National Hydrometeorology Service of Azerbaijan to take the floor. You have the floor, Madam. Dear Chairman, dear distinguished colleagues, I would like to greet you on behalf of Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources of Azerbaijan. It's a pleasure to see that despite unusual and challenging times caused by COVID-19, staying safe and healthy, the countries of the Group of 77 and China joined their efforts to address pandemic implications on climate change activities launched for a low-carbon development uh, part over 
2030 agenda. To ensure economic stability in Azerbaijan, social economic support package in the amount of 2 billion US dollars has been adopted and implemented. As a responsible and reliable member of the world community, Azerbaijan has provided voluntary financial contribution to the world uh, health organization and humanitarian assistance to more than 30 countries in support of global efforts against the pandemic. During the summit level meeting on the non-aligned uh, movement contact group in response to coronavirus held on 4 May 2020, the President of Azerbaijan proposed to hold a special session of the UN General Assembly in response to COVID-19. Uh, COVID uh, via video conference, and it has been supported by more than 130 uh, member uh, states. If the population of 10 million people, Azerbaijan, contributes only 0.1% uh, of uh, total uh, global greenhouse gas emission. However, having industrial legacy from Soviet period, water shortage and the desertification make our country highly uh, sensitive to the effects of climate change. Our country has submitted an ambition commitment in its NDC targeting 35% reduction of greenhouse gas emission by uh, 2030. Azerbaijan implements large-scale project to mitigate the impact of climate change during the last years, millions of trees have been planted and thousands uh, hectares of uh, forest are restored. They also will join uh, to the initiative of Republic of Turkey on planting of 11 uh, million trees in November this year. Those activities will significantly help to absorb carbon emission from the atmosphere and uh, compensate impact on the environment. Unfortunately, the regional cooperation is constrained by occupation of the territories of Azerbaijan by Armenia, which has been uh, violating fundamental norms and principles of international law for more than 30 years. Recently, armed force of Armenia has launched another act of military aggression against of Azerbaijan, deliberately uh, targeting civilians in the densely populated area. As a result of attack, many of civilians were killed and wounded. Azerbaijan, being a party of many international multilateral environmental treaties, and uh, more than any other countries of the region, faces serious obstacles in implementing its objectives due to the occupation. Occupation of Azerbaijan territories by Armenia has been outlined in uh, our NDC document as one of the major barriers in reaching this target. Armenia has been pursuing a policy of aggression not only against the people of Azerbaijan, but also its nature and biodiversity which led to disastrous impact on wide life uh, of natural uh, resources. Hundreds of thousands of forest uh, natural monuments and as a whole unique ecosystem of caucuses are under the threat of uh, ex uh, extend, uh, extending. We call international community to condemn uh, Armenian aggression, which continues to violate uh, UN Security Council resolution 8022, 8053, 8074, and 8084, requiring full and unconditional withdrawal of Armenia forces from the occupied territory of Azerbaijan. Dear colleagues, reducing the impact of climate change sustainable and resilient recovery from current situation requires solidarity and cooperation of the world uh, of the world community. I wish you strong health and success by uh, to all of you in your efforts to make the world uh, more safer and greener. Thank you for your attention. I thank the director for her intervention. Uh, may I ask that all microphones be muted? And now I invite our final speaker in this segment, 
His Excellency Rodrigo Corazo, for the permanent representative of Costa Rica, to take the floor. All other speakers, please uh, be patient. We ask for your patience. You will you will have a chance to intervene in the next session. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador Pierre. Uh, the points have been made. Uh, your Vice President, uh, whom I salute together with, with uh, Guyana, for convening this meeting and organizing all the response of G77 plus China in this uh, very difficult year. He, he made it uh, clear what has been done is has not been sufficient uh, uh, either to achieve the pledges nor uh, the goals. We need more urgency and more ambition on a triple front, uh, health, climate, and uh, biodiversity loss. Opportunities are there, uh, but we are time bound. Costa Rica, together with France, leads the High Ambition Coalition, which has been mentioned, which jointly uh, addresses the biodiversity and the climate catastrophes uh, rather than crisis with the goals of 30, 30, 30, 30% 30 protection of land, mass, ocean, is, uh, territory and for the year 2030. Oceans must be taken care of, as has been also expressed by the Minister of uh, Chile. New patterns of production and consumption transition to a greener economies are absolutely indispensable. The reliance on nature-based solutions are the, the great opportunities of our times. They are the best tools to restore the dignity of the planet that has been mentioned. Finance is there, just going elsewhere, and we must harness the orientation towards this green recovery efforts. And lastly, we must work putting together the synergies. Yes, the Vice President mentioned so many events. Well, let's put them together in their synergies and make a one effort out of all of this. Thank you very much. I thank His Excellency for those uh, remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies all, we have run out of time, but we've had a very rich series of interventions and statements made. Uh, in, in, in normal circumstances, I will invite the, the discussants and presenters to, 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 to wrap, give some concluding remarks, but unfortunately, we will have to dispense with that procedure. Uh, allow me only to highlight some very key points made by our discussions today. Uh, Dr. Sakona reminded us of the need for leadership and not just any time of type of leadership, but, the, but responsible leadership and visionary leadership. He also spoke about the need to connect short-term and long-term priorities uh, and imperatives with addressing the COVID-19 and the, and the climate ch uh, challenge in terms of sustainable development. We heard from Ms. Wallenstein about the need for the right investment today in terms of decarbonization, in terms of jobs, and in terms of sustainable infrastructure, particularly. And we also heard from Dr. Bhattacharya, who spoke about new forms of vulnerabilities, mostly linked to climate change, and the, the unfortunate trade-offs that have to be made in terms of both resource allocation as well as policy design. Uh, that, in sum, are the main takeaways from uh, our, our presenters in this session. Allow me now to pass the floor to my good friend and colleague, Ambassador Selwyn Hart, with humble apologies for taking up so much of your time. You have the floor, sir. Thank you so much, Ambassador Pierre. And at the outset, let me really thank and congratulate the government of Guyana really for convening this important session. Um, it's really great and good to be back home in the G77 in China um, among so many familiar faces and friends. Uh, as all speakers have said, um, developing countries have been hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 pandemic and the fiscal and financial pressures 
that the pandemic has caused. Uh, on top of, of course, this once in a generation um, health health emergency, and many have also said that this crisis represents an opportunity, a once in a generation opportunity, to pursue transformational and structural change and ensure a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient future. However, the reality is for developing countries to capitalize on this opportunity, we need, or developing countries need, an enabling international environment. And many of the issues around debt and liquidity are being pursued um, and championed by the UN Secretary General um, through the COVID um, financing for development um, process that he initiated with the Prime Minister of Chile, I'm sorry, with the Prime Minister of Canada and, um, and also the Prime Minister of Jamaica. Climate finance must be aligned not only with the recovery, as many of you have said, but with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Science is telling us that we still have time to achieve the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. It remains within reach, however, it will require significant structural um, changes. So as we go into this panel and the resultant discussion, I'm hoping that we can focus on many of the solutions. First and foremost, um, I, I would, would like to list very briefly four, four um, important conditions that must be addressed. One, the issue of the scale and predictability of climate finance. The $100 billion, the decades-long commitment to mobilize $100 billion must be delivered, and it must be delivered with a sense of urgency. And this is one of the major priorities of the Secretary General, as my very good friend um, um, Paul, um, the, the, the distinguished minister of Nicaragua, stated. Secondly, the quality of climate finance needs to improve significantly. Grants and affordable and concessional financing must make a greater share of this mix. This will help to significantly mobilize greater sources of private finance to deliver um, and, and leverage change at the scale and pace required. Third, many of you have already mentioned the question of access. Many developing countries, especially the SIDS and the least developed countries, um, continue to face significant challenges with access and climate finance. And fourth and finally, balance. At present, adaptation finance represents a mere one-fifth of financing um, mobilized for mitigation. Given that developing countries are on the front lines of the fight against climate change, um, greater priority must be accorded to mobilizing resources for adaptation and resilience, especially for the most vulnerable. So to help frame this discussion as well, we have two distinguished speakers, um, Ms. Alicia Barsena, um, who will go first, the Executive Secretary of um, the United Econo um, UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, followed by the Minister of Environment of Rwanda. Alicia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and all protocols are served. Just I want to thank Caroline Rodriguez, uh, my esteemed ambassador, for this invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to address the G77 in China because this conference is essential to make a strong call, call for decisive international cooperation and solidarity on the basis of the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. This principle is one of the most important political contributions of the G77 in China in the history of the United Nations. In climate change, we confront global fundamental asymmetries. There is already limited remaining carbon budget on the atmosphere before collapse, but this budget has been basically consumed by developed countries and little space is left for developing countries. Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, contributes only with 8.5% of carbon emissions, while it is highly vulnerable to its impact. So it is urgent to address climate action and ambition, basically by developed countries and big emerging economies, because they need to open space to small and medium-sized developing countries 
and support their adaptation initiatives through concessional funding. We must embark in an energy transition of enormous proportions to decarbonize the economy and concrete projects with solutions based on nature. Let me put an example of mangroves. If we, if we restore mangroves, they will reduce the flooded area by 30%. So, but developing countries do not have the fiscal space to invest and are facing severe balance of payments and fiscal deficits. So let me illustrate very concrete proposals that I want to make today to you by addressing the predicament of the Caribbean small island development states. Caribbean countries contribute only with 0.3% of global emissions, please 0.3%, but are highly vulnerable to climate change. These economies are facing a triple vulnerability challenge, high debt burden, high debt servicing, unprecedented health and economic emergency with great contraction of tourism services, and exports of natural resources. Insularity and size matters because the small size of small island development states makes the passage of hurricanes a national catastrophe, especially when 70% of their populations live in the coastline at elevations less than five meters above sea level. Caribbean countries spend three billion dollars in recovery and reconstruction every year. And this is a major contributing factor to their high levels of public debt. And the negative growth they are expecting this year is 6.9% with the collapse of tourism and goods exports. So, and the other problem, and I end my, my diagnosis here to go to the proposals, is that by virtue of their very small populations, they are classified as middle and upper income countries using the unidimensional measure of per capita GDP to disqualify them from access to concessional aid. Now, borrowing is not an option for Caribbean countries because the debt services is ranging from 25 to 75% of their government revenues. There's no capacity to invest in anything, so much less to innovate. So if we really want a green and blue recovery and align this COVID response, to Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement, we need to do the following. Is it possible? Yes, it is. But the first thing we need is a change in the development model and move into key sectors that decarbonize the economies and key adaptation projects while generating jobs. We presented a, a, a proposal building the future transformative recovery with equality and sustainability, and we included their economic, fiscal, and financial evidence demonstrating that it's possible to simultaneously grow, redistribute, and decarbonize, reducing poverty and, uh, and improving welfare. We calculate that with a growth of 4% annual growth in the coming decade, I mean, starting from next year and the following year, but with decisive redistributive action, transferring 0.5% of GDP from the 1% richer to the 1% poorer to protect household income and aggregate demand, it is possible to eliminate poverty. Yes, it is. And decarbonize our economies. This needs to be accompanied with a big private and public shock, investment shock, linked to areas such as renewable energy, aquaculture, agroecology, digital inclusion, coastal restoration, and a very important a uh, decision on industrial policies to enhance our endogenous manufacturing capabilities, which will help us to improve our external trade deficit. We need real and decisive cooperation from the international community on the basis that solidarity is self-interest. So let me then put some examples of the proposals I want to make. First, multilateral and bilateral debt alleviation. We have proposed a debt alleviation and swap initiative for the debt for the Caribbean, which is a unique hybrid mechanism to provide short-term debt relief and fiscal space that countries urgently need, while facilitating low-cost financing for medium to long-term investment. The proposal is to establish a Caribbean Resilience Fund to facilitate the necessary capital investment. We estimate that an initial capitalization requires $6.9 billion, which represents 12% of the total regional debt. 
We look forward to the engagement of the Global Climate Fund because there is a need to complement this and to create this Caribbean Resilience Fund. Secondly, expand the scope of the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative to include small island development economies, now considered middle income, as we said, and extend the term of the SSI beyond 2020. Third, increase liquidity by issuing new special drawing rights and the reallocation of idle ones. If we do this for $500 billion, if the international community and the, and the IMF does this and the superavit economies, this will bring a $500 billion, this will bring $2 billion to the Caribbean economies. Fourth, and this is I know very audacious, but we need a waiver on property rights of climate technology for the next decade. This is essential. We cannot continue paying property rights in, 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 in small island development states. And fifth, to convene the private sector since a significant proportion of the debt is held in private hands. And this includes, I have to say, an urgent call to the rating agency, to the credit rating agencies, basically the three most important, to stop rating downwards during the pandemics. And we need to call the banking sector to restore the corresponding banking in the Caribbean. We propose four instruments. We propose, number one, link debt service as a measure of sovereign capacity to pay. And that includes income-linked bonds. And that is the GDP export or income bonds that will become a counter-cyclical instrument that ties debt repayment to the capacity of the country to repay. These bonds are an insurance mechanism in bad times against fiscal liquidity crunches. Secondly, institutionalize state contingent debt instruments, state contingent debt instruments to allow payment standstills or maturity extensions that respond to the volatility of income, liquidity pressure, and debt distress from exogenous shocks. Hurricane clauses are an example in the Caribbean and should become a norm in the future. Thirdly, the bond market should help us to issue green and blue bonds. And finally, for tax and fiscal cooperation to eradicate tax evasion, eliminate unjustified tax incentives and perverse subsidies, which represent already 2% of GDP in lack. Let me put forward these proposals, Mr. Chair. I know some of them are very audacious. They are, and we should be, we should be bold. We have to be bold. And I want to say that ECLAC joins our voice with you, the G77 in China, to advocate for the small island development states, and particularly for the Caribbean country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much um, for, as usual, um, a very great intervention, Madam Executive Secretary, and um, as well for the very five concrete proposals that you have made. Um, I'm sure that all of the members um, of the G77 would love to have a copy of your statement. So. Um, uh, uh, it would be useful if you can send us a copy of this statement with these very five concrete, actionable, but, 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 but all five of these proposals, I believe, are grounded in reality, given the scale and scope of the challenge that we all face. Um, I now wish to invite the Minister of Environment of Rwanda um, to make, um, make a presentation. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, Your Excellency Dr. Mohamed Ifanari, Honorable Hector, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Guyana, Excellencies, Federal Ministers, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today for this virtual flagship event under the theme maintaining a low carbon development path towards the 2030 agenda in the era of COVID-19. I would like to extend my appreciation to the government of Guyana through Your Excellency Mohamed Ali and Honorable Hag Todd, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation for chairing and convening this event. This flagship event is an important platform whereby as countries sharing knowledge lesson learned and best practices with respect to climate action amid the COVID-19 crisis, 
require recovering toward the 23rd agenda. It also gives us as group G77 and China members an opportunity to renew our commitment on the urgency to strengthen climate action and adaptation effort through revised national determined contribution by December 2020. Rwanda is highly committed to join the effort with the group of G77 and China and global community at large to combat climate change, maintain low carbon pathway, and hence achieve aspirations of Paris Agreement despite COVID-19 crisis. To walk the talk, the government of Rwanda affirmed its commitment to climate action by its recent submission of the updated nationally determined contribution to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which we submitted on 19th May 2020 amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Rwanda's revised NDC features a reduction of greenhouse gas emission of 38% compared to the business as usual by 2030. On total funding requirements of 11 billion US dollars for the implementation of Rwanda NDC, adaptation investment account 5.3 billion USD, which show the importance that Rwanda attached to low carbon development path agenda. However, raising financing for mitigation and adaptation to climate change is more critical today than ever before, given the global health, socioeconomic, and environmental challenges posed by the current COVID-19 pandemic and the urgent need to implement our commitment. To date, climate financing to assist developing countries realize their ambition to grow along low carbon pathways and develop the resilience promised by developed countries is still yet to materialize. The importance of maintaining low carbon development pathway in response to climate change is undeniable amid COVID-19 pandemic and due consideration is required in enhanced NDC to make sure that we are moving in the correct direction with no one left behind. I invite all our colleagues G77 and China members to take significant steps to deliver transformative action that the climate crisis requires and to join voice to ensure that the next COP26 deliver fruitful outcome. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Minister, for bringing um, that very strong national and regional perspective um, to our discussion. Um, we will now have short interventions from three distinguished discussants um, who will provide different perspectives to the topic under discussion. Um, can we start with um, our colleague and friend from the Green Climate Fund, um, Mr. Pa Ausman? Pa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, distinguished uh, honorable ministers, excellencies, uh, all protocols duly and respectfully observed. Uh, greetings from uh, Sondo on behalf of the 
Executive Director of the Green Climate Fund, I would like to convey appreciation to the government of Guyana for facilitating this uh, important event. Uh, let me uh, affirm the commitment of the Green Climate Fund to support uh, developing countries in accessing uh, resources to implement uh, their low carbon climate resilient development uh, pathways. COVID-19 has demonstrated that uh, we really need to do more. And the GCF has taken a three-pronged approach to climate resilient recovery. The first one is uh, leveraging the readiness support to ensure that countries access technical assistance and financial support to craft low carbon climate resilient, integrated, inclusive economic stimulus measures to be incorporated in their updated uh, NDCs. In parallel, support would also be provided to enhance and update NDCs, taking into account economic stimulus measures identified in order to finance the implementation of climate investment with high socioeconomic uh, benefits. The second approach was to mitigate impacts on our ongoing project portfolio through flexible adaptive management measures. The third one is to ensure that we maintain climate ambition uh, during the COVID-19 Oh, error. Uh, it is important to note that uh, the GCF continues to develop a very strong pipeline targeting uh, a broad range of countries and specifically uh, to particularly vulnerable countries uh, such as Africa, LDCs, and SEEDS. And to date, the board has approved over 100 and 43 projects worth 6.2 billion US dollars of GCF funding and expected to leverage 14.9 billion US dollars of co-financing mobilized. As of September, 108 projects were under implementation, accounting for 4.6 billion US dollars, which is 76% of total approved funding, and 88 of these projects, 88% of these projects have received disbursements uh, of GCF funds that amount to 1.35 uh, billion. Now, despite COVID-19, we continue to provide uh, technical assistance to developing countries through their national designated authorities or direct access entities to develop uh, concept notes and funding proposals that would come into uh, the pipeline. Uh, one will argue that what, what else are we doing? And in light of uh, the discussions and the recommendations that we've had, uh, the GCF is also coming up with new initiatives uh, to foster policy integrations in NDCs that will really lead to investment plans across various sectors and also dedicate uh, low carbon and climate resilient financial products such as green bonds, solar asset bank securities. Uh, the other initiative is uh, looking at new financing instruments for global solidarity such as uh, debt swap for climate. Uh, we would also look into blended finance for climate action looking at multi-country sovereign climate guarantee funds and uh, pioneer equity funds. So these are some of the things that we will be doing as we uh, head towards uh, COP26 and beyond to ensure that uh, countries are well prepared towards uh, low carbon climate uh, resilient uh, development. We uh, are also uh, happy that uh, despite the COVID-19, the board is meeting to approve uh, more projects. In the next uh, 10 days, the board is going to meet uh, to approve projects worth, uh, to decide our approval of projects worth uh, over 1 billion. So we just want to assure 
uh, you of our continued commitment to support countries in accessing the fund. Uh, we will put in place measures of further simplifying uh, our processes based on board guidance. Uh, we would uh, also continue to ensure that there is a balance as uh, uh, indicated in our governing instrument, balance between uh, mitigation and uh, adaptation in terms of 50-50. In fact, currently in our pipeline uh, of fund for approved funding proposals, we have 50% uh, of this uh, funding in grant equivalent that is dedicated to adaptation projects and 47 to mitigation projects. Uh, we have taken note of what is being said here, but uh, I just want to assure you that uh, the GCF is ready. It's your fund uh, and would continue to provide the necessary support to achieve the UNFC triple C uh, mandate and the Paris Agreement. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Pa, um, for your um, intervention um, and, for, and, for, and for providing members of the G77 and all of us um, these strong assurances that the GCF remains um, open for business, that, that it has as a major priority responding to the immediate needs of the developing world to respond to crisis, but, but also to um, uh, continue to address um, the climate crisis. Um, your words on um, um, further simplification of um, the procedures to access resources from the Green Climate Fund is also welcome, um, as well as the commitments really to, to ensure much greater balance of the projects um, in your pipeline and your willingness and open to deploy new and innovative instruments, including um, some of the instruments that were uh, mentioned earlier by the executive secretary um, of, of ECLAC. Um, these are really great assurances um, that you've made to the developing world, and I'm sure that they will be pursued. Um, I now give the floor um, to Dr. Colin Young, um, who's the executive director of the Caribbean Community Climate Change um, Center, Colin, the floor is yours to provide um, um, a Caribbean and regional perspective to this discussion. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Hart. And uh, I too want to uh, lend my congratulations to the government of Guyana for putting together this extremely important flagship event uh, to discuss and keep the ambition climate ambition alive. Um, I also want to um, quickly just acknowledge the excellent interventions from Madam Executive Secretary of ECLAC. I think her five, her five points um, are, are right on, the, uh, on point um, to frame what needs to occur if we are going to achieve the kind of alignment between our climate ambition and, and climate finance. I want to uh, essentially lend my voice to discuss three brief issues that I think complements those five issues quite well, um, but from the, the sort of Caribbean perspective. Um, the first, I think, uh, that we, what we need to do in order to, to unlock the climate financing at scale, the fund the climate ambition in the region requires first that the Caribbean urgently define the scale of climate finance required to meet our climate ambition. Uh, this requires that we do the following four things. First, we have to complete the articulation and submission of the enhanced NDCs that incorporates both mitigation and adaptation actions, but obviously with a bias towards adaptation. We then have to quantify the implementation costs of those NDCs at both the national and regional scales, uh, including also in terms of the agenda, uh, 2030 agenda. And then we have to determine the finance gap that exists. Uh, once we have that, we have to match the NDC implementation with appropriate financial instruments. Uh, these can be, as was discussed, blended finance, debt for climate swaps, green, blue bonds, concessional financing, uh, climate guarantees, and so on. And of course, we have to then look at creating the enabling policy environment 
to channel the appropriate climate finance into the region. This obviously has to have the private sector as a major part of um, the requirements. So in other words, what we, we need to know what we need at what scale and develop a plan to finance it. The second thing we need to do uh, at the regional level is that we must embrace a regional and programmatic approach to access climate finance at scale to meet our climate ambitions nationally. Uh, there are two things that I believe would help us in this regard. The first is that we should adopt uh, a, a kind of a regional uh, knowledge hub or a think tank that would pool the technical and financial experts and capacities to structure appropriate financing models to finance climate change ambition in the region. This would help us to help bridge the capacity gaps that exist in some countries. It will allow us to scale up successes across the region, and it would most importantly promote common approaches to harmonize policies and regulations across the region to reduce policy and political risks that are necessary to attract and crowd in private sector uh, participation. And the second thing we need to do there is obviously then to develop regional programmatic high quality funding proposals using various delivery partners that will address common climate change issues, uh, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation across multiple countries to mobilize the financing to meet climate ambitions and the implementation of those NDCs. The third thing that we need to do um, to scale up uh, ambition is that we obviously need a revamping or a transformation, as in the words of, of Minister Charles from, from Jamaica, a transformation of the international climate change financial architecture to enable effective and efficient flow of climate finance to the Caribbean, to, to SIDS and other developing countries. It is very obvious, and, and this we state this ad nauseum, that the current architecture is fragmented and difficult to navigate. The processes are cumbersome and overly bureaucratic. Currently, in the five Cs, is a delivery partner uh, to multiple funds, but it can take upwards of two years to secure funding from concept to disbursement, even for an uh, entity like the five Cs that has acquired technical capacity to access climate finance on behalf of member states. That is simply too long. Uh, the second uh, thing there is we need to, a special consideration for the Caribbean that incorporates climate risk and climate vulnerability rather than GDP per capita. To channel the appropriate financing, including concessional financing to fund climate ambition. I believe recently the, our leaders in the Caribbean have been making this clarion call ad nauseum, but especially so since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And the third point in terms of revamping and transforming the international climate change financial architecture that I believe we ought to pursue and continue to do is the continued solidarity and united front of this group of G77 and China to hold developing countries accountable to raise their financing ambition necessary for developing countries to meet their climate ambitions. COP26 outcomes next year must reflect this ambition, both in terms of enhanced NDCs and in terms of enhanced financial commitment and financing uh, commit, um, ambitions. So the synergy between climate, the synergy between climate ambition and climate will mean that the right kind of finance is channeled to the right types of projects in the right places, on the right scale, and at the right time. To date, this outcome has been more of a pipe dream than reality for us in the region. In many ways, the climate finance pendulum in terms of access and timeliness has been swinging in the wrong direction. This must change. We must not waste the opportunities, however, that is presented by COVID-19 for the global community, including our leaders in the region, to rebuild better with climate resilience and sustainable development in mind. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Young, and um, your, your um, four points were um, extremely clear. You made that point, which applies to all G77 countries around access. Um, quite frankly, two years from concept to disbursement is really unacceptable. 
and um, and, and 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 I really hope that our colleagues colleagues um, from the multilateral funds as well as the MDBs are listening loud and clear. Um, secondly, you made a very good point about the NDC and the NDC enhancement before COP. 26 and using the NDCs really as a vehicle for mobilizing um, both public and private finance. And, and thirdly, and I think um, equally important, is the notion of regional approaches um, for, for regions like the Caribbean, like the Central American region, the LDCs, Africa, the Pacific, looking closely at regional, regional um, approaches really can help to overcome some of the capacity and other constraints that individual countries might have um, in not only addressing climate change, but also in accessing climate funds. Our, our final discussant um, is a very good friend and colleague, Zahir, Fakir, who is the G77 and China Finance Coordinator, who will put a bow on everything. Um, um, very experienced, not only negotiator on climate finance related issues on behalf of um, Africa and the G77, but but um, really, you know, he knows all of the issues, and um, and and it's and it's good that you're coming at the end, um, Zahir, to put a bow on everything before we go into the interactive discussion. And um, just to indicate that our speakers list for the interactive discussion is closed, we have seven speakers um, after Zahir finalizes his intervention. Zahir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Hart, and it's good to see you. Uh, I, I hope you can hear me clearly. We can, we can. Super. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Selwyn. Um, my intervention in this round will be a little different because I'm wearing the hat of the G77 uh, and China Finance Coordinator. Uh, so uh, I will be as brutal as possible because I'm the one that goes out and bats for you in the negotiations to make sure that you get the scale, the predictability, the access, and uh, the, the, the issues of the quality of finance, etc. cetera. Uh, I think it's important to note, and, and uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Edmund Burke who said, Ambition can creep as well as soar. And if we do not have ambition on uh, finance uh, and the means of implementation, that will define whether our ambition and mitigation and adaptation would really creep or would it, or will it soar. I want to maybe just uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the honorable members and the excellencies, just catch the situation that we're currently in. And this is five years after Paris. We look at the state of bilateral and multilateral funding. Uh, you look at the Green Climate Fund. A lot of people have talked about that. Recent uh, replenishment, less than what it had in the initial resource mobilization period. The Global Environment Facility, 36% less in its last uh, uh, replenishment than what it had before Paris. And the consequence of that is that you've had an increase in co-financing. Uh, meaning that you are required to provide more finance in order to get that $1 out of the GDF. You look at the ODA, $153 billion after 50 years, only five countries are actually meeting, meeting, meeting that 0 0.7. The average sits at 0 0.3. You look at the MDBs uh, for the last eight years, they've only provided in climate finance $298 billion. And in the last report that uh, came out of the MDBs, they quoted $61 billion. But if you look at it very carefully, 18 billion or 19 billion of that has been climate finance going to European Union countries. So the scale of uh, finance that you are looking at is rather dismal. Uh, and that's the one thing that I want. When you look at debt issues, 191%, that's the debt stock in 2018 of developing countries. That's, that's, that's even prior to COVID. It's debt servicing on average over 10, 11% is being paid towards debt servicing. Now look at climate finance. If you look at the MDB report, just over 4% of the MDB financing is in the form of grants. And if you look at it in mitigation and adaptation, only 12% of adaptation finance is in grant, and only 4% uh, or 2% or actually of mitigation is in grant. Now, come back to the point that uh, His Excellency, the President made in the beginning about uh, grant versus culture. Most of your financing is coming in the form of loan financing. If you look at adaptation versus mitigation finance, the average sits at 24%. So 24% of all climate financing is going to adaptation. 
and then 100 billion. This is, this is the one that one needs to demystify. If you were in Copenhagen, you would recognize that there were two very important to demystify. There were two very important words used. There was the huge use of the provision and the fast start and the mobilization under the 100 billion. And people don't fully understand or grasp the meaning thereof because that small little word has a fundamental impact on the entire financial architecture. The mere fact that they said that uh, developed countries would jointly mobilize 100 billion, the commitment is not the provisioning of 100 billion. The commitment is the mobilization of the 100 billion. The unintended consequence thereof is that their demand to leverage money becomes higher, much greater and much higher. And I'm, I'm sure many of you would be shocked to find this. When you do find 100 billion reports, you might actually find that developed countries, developing countries have contributed more towards that 100 billion figure than what you actually uh, been received from. So these are all elements that one needs to take into consideration. If you're looking at scale, the only way you're going to get scale is if we get developing developed countries to actually fulfill their commitments. You cannot continue de declining, uh, de diminishing replenishments of funds like the JEF and the GCF. And these are important funds because these are the funds that allows you to be able to do the leveraging and the mobilization. But if we declare, uh, de diminish the resources, that means there's a higher demand on them uh, getting those other resources, which ultimately has the consequence of the nature and the kind of projects that are financed and the countries that are financed. If I'm getting a project coming to the GCF and one project has a higher leveraging ratio than another project, there is an unintended bias towards those projects. Uh, if you have adaptation projects, most cases adaptation projects really struggle to be able to attract or leverage private sector. So there's a bias against adaptation projects. So we, when addressing the issue of ambition, we need to look at climate finance within the ecosystem that it operates in. We're having a big problem with funds like the GCFs and the others in the sense that they're trying to morph and for become a uh, an MDB, let's say, that sense. They each of the different funds operate in an environment where we have or we need to have complementarity and coherence. They work with one another, not compete uh, with one, one another. I've heard what Paul has said, but I'm really worried when, when I look at what the direction in which the GCF is wanting to go. Uh, subsidization of financial institutions, etc., which is fine, but it then comes back to the question of how do we get more grant money? How do we get more scale? Uh, scale? How do we allow for more opportunities for smaller countries, for LDCs and such? How do we deal with scaling up the finance of adaptation, etc.? So uh, just in, 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 in short, I think some of the issues that we need to be thinking about is the issue also about how we address the declining ODAs and declines and declining uh, uh, climate finance within the multilateral system. Historical responsibility is something that is extremely important. If you're wanting to see real leadership, then developed countries need to accept and, and take ownership of the historical responsibility. This is having a major implication on why there is this bias against adaptation, as well as why there's a reluctance to deal with the issues of loss and damage. And these are pretty much issues that many LDCs and SIDs are looking at. We need development space. I know that there's a lot of talk about uh, fossil fuel, uh, disinvestments, etc. But many of us developing countries are sitting with assets that potentially will be stranded over a period of time. One needs to have that development space. It needs to be respected in order for us to make that transition. Now, we cannot have a situation where tomorrow immediately uh, you, you get uh, funding stopped because you have fossil fuels on your balance sheets, etc. And this is the problem Guyana would probably have. At the, at the end of the day, also, we need to also understand that increasing or greater debt is not going to be the solution to uh, addressing the issues of climate action, particularly in developing countries. With that, Selwyn, I thank you for giving me the opportunity, and I'll stop there, and I hope I provoked many people. As always, and, and really thanks to uh, placing all of these issues um, squarely on the table um, in, in a very practical way on some of the challenges um, around the um, scale and predictability of resources, around the quality of um, the current finance being mobilized. Your point on the need um, for more grant resources has been echoed um, by many of the speakers this morning. The issues around um, the challenges that developing countries continue 
um, to face around access and the need for there to be much greater balance between um, adaptation and resilience. I, I, I think you also made a really good point on the need for us to also look at issues around the just transition. Um, the just transition issues, um, especially for those developing countries that are um, highly dependent on, on um, a carbon economy, these are issues that must be discussed within the group and, 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 and also place um, high on the agenda of the international community, how, how to address many of the just transition issues that many developing countries will be experiencing. So, Colleagues, we um, I have I wish to apologize to the distinguished ambassador of Guyana, um, whose session is next. But we have um, six speakers um, on the speakers list: the Vice Minister of Peru, the PR of Guatemala, the DPR of Indonesia, the DPR of Afghanistan, um, the representative from Panama, and of of, of um, course my very good friend, um, Minister Paul. Onquist of um, Nicaragua, the English Minister of Nicaragua. So, start with the Vice Minister of Peru, Sir Yaftafu. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you very much for the for the invitation to join you in this in this meeting. Um, COVID nineteen is confronting all countries around the world with two options: pay for the economic and social disaster it has caused by intensifying destruction of natural resources and lower or lowering the planning and environmental requirements of infrastructure or other investments, or take advantage to strongly push transitions already ongoing, such as the inclusion of renewables in our energy matrix, full deployment of electromobility, or scaling of deforestation free productive change. Peru, about to celebrate its bicentennial in July next year, has taken the decision to go for the second option. And in such regard, it's taking firm steps to achieve a green, inclusive, low carbon and climate resilient development, where our finance has a key role to respond effectively to the changing environment, to the new challenges we are facing, and to increase climate ambition. Please let me now share you our progress consistent with 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, especially linked to climate ambition and climate finance. First, this year we will submit our enhanced NDC with greater ambition, transparency, and sense of urgency, both in adaptation and mitigation. Last month, Peru's president launched our high-level commission on climate change, which is a permanent discussion platform of the highest level of decision makers in Peru at the ministerial level, and includes representation from subnational and local governments. This decision reflects the commitment of the Peruvian government to address climate change issues at the highest political level. Second, we have begun the process of updating our national climate change strategy with a long-term vision to 2050, Peru's technical proposal for carbon neutrality by 2050, and our national adaptation plan are the building blocks for this strategy that will be launched next year and will include a comprehensive participatory process. Third, we are developing our climate finance strategy to identify financial feasibility for the implementation of our NDCs. In June 2021, we will finalize this strategy, and as part of the development of the strategy, we are identifying diverse source of funding, including public actions to increase the private and financial sector participation, international funds available under the convention, such as, such as the Green Climate Fund, the GF, and the Adaptation Fund, among other available bilateral and multilateral sources. We would like to highlight that climate finance is a cornerstone to implement and enhance climate action. The need of increase in climate action to achieve the mitigation targets and the resilience of our countries requires a rerouting of investments towards sustainable alternatives, as well as an increase of interventions that enable sustainable practices. It will require an increase of existing economic and financial instruments and also the modification and development of innovative instruments that catalyze the plans and strategies into concrete actions. The new finance goals must be assigned, assigned to significantly increase public and private climate actions across all sectors. It needs to enable bigger and broader interventions across the different topics that are including mitigation and in adaptation, and must enable actions that consider their needs and circumstances to ensure meaningful impacts. Finally, Peru wishes to acknowledge the government of Guyana for this event that allows us 
to share our actions and thoughts on climate ambition and climate finance. Thank you very much. Ambassador, are you still with us? I think the ambassador might have left um, the meeting. I now give the floor to the DPR of Indonesia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ambassador Hart. Uh, Your Excellency, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Guyana. Uh, Excellencies, at the outside, Allow me to congratulate Guyana on this important management meeting of the Group of 77. As an archipelagic state that is vulnerable to climate change, Indonesia remains committed to address climate change using domestic resources and with international support. Let me highlight several points. First, our recovery efforts must reinforce our global commitments. In our recovery, the national economy recovery programs focuses on economics and health aspect, as well as communities' climate resilience and the need for community-based recovery. Some of our efforts include increased coverage of land and sea protected areas, while ensure sustainable economic growth through ecotourism, forest bathing, and forest healing. Enhance productivity over forest production while reducing emission, as well as enhancing carbon stocks through forest and land rehabilitation, including mangrove and peatland, and establishing the low carbon development initiative and expand renewable energy such as biofuel, geothermal, and microhydro. Secondly, global partnership is crucial to enhance climate action and finance. Indonesia is working to promote global partnership and climate finance by, by preparing regulations on renewable energy pricing to adapt fit in uh, tariff simplify procurement and enhance bankability, promoting energy efficiency by applying better standards and technology in commercial buildings and industries and encourage more efficient equipment, establishing the Environment Fund Agency to manage environment-related funds. Lastly, let me stress one point. We cannot address both the pandemic and climate change alone, and these are the battles that we cannot lose. Indonesia therefore calls for greater solidarity and cooperation through the G77 and suggests to further focus our work to, on concrete cooperation on climate change, both within our group and with our partners. Thank you. So much, Ambassador. And um, I, I just wish to stress again the point, the last point that you made on the need for much greater solidarity and cooperation, not only with our developing partners, but also within the group of 77 um, and China. And, and, and I think that's an excellent point that you made. Um, I understand that distinguished ambassador of Guatemala is back. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for giving me the floor. Guatemala, I want to thank each of the distinguished panelists for the presentation, especially to Mrs. Alicia Barcenas, who clearly has described the actual and the upcoming challenges that climate change represents to the sustainable development in our countries. We also congratulate the Cooperative Republic of Guyana as G77 chairmanship for holding this event that allows us as a group to reinforce our position in an issue that impacts directly the well-being and the very existence of our peoples. There is an urgency of addressing the needs of the developing countries in the face of the increasing frequency and severity of climate impacts. High ambition is required, not only in mitigation, but also in adaptation, and it means the implementation, including loss and damage. We support that the group should continue fostering and understanding understanding that the COP26, a roadmap, is agreed with clear milestones for the process of negotiation of the new finance goals. Enhance transparency and predictability and to accomplish the $100 billion goal that has been extended by 2025. 2025. We also support the long-term finance agenda under the convention continues to be a political space 
for accountability of financial commitments of development countries' parties in the Convention. Guatemala would like to express its concerns regarding the access to climate finance for middle-income countries. Guatemala is among the most climate-vulnerable countries, but because it is a classified as a middle-income country, the lack of access to concessional financing is a barrier that needs to be better addressed, as well as the need to generate more climate-sensitive private investment that will contribute to sustainable and responsible economic growth and development. We would appreciate your views regarding this issue of middle-income countries and finance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, I now give the floor to distinguished Deputy Permanent Representative of Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. C can you hear me, please? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for giving me the floor. Let me extend our appreciation to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Guyana for organizing this virtual flagship uh, ministerial meeting on maintaining a low carbon development path toward the 2030 agenda in the era of COVID-19. This meeting is an important opportunity to reinforce our group's position. Afghanistan welcome and support the joint communique. We underscore our shared responsibility to achieve the SDGs and the needs for increased solidarity with the most vulnerable people in countries especially countries in special situation, including countries in conflict in post-conflict situation. We will not be built back better following COVID-19 without a clear plan for climate resilience, adaptation and mitigation. Finances, financing is the most critical building block to achieve our ambitions. Despite the impact of the climate change in Afghanistan and our vulnerability to the future climate-related climate shocks, we can only access limited finance for national adaptation and mitigation of efforts. We have found that one of the major obstacles to attract public and private finance for climate change adaptation is the real and perceived risk associated with investment in Afghanistan. Our risk profile deters investment and leaves us depend on the smaller group ground grants and unable to make long-term investment. More emphasis should also be placed on access to other resources and technologies as well capacity building. Moreover, increased, increased South-South cooperation and triangular cooperation will be a critical to reach our financial and technical needs. In conclusion, the global challenges include climate change, COVID-19, and terrorism needs collective response. We will not be able to achieve or to fight the global challenges at the uh, national level alone. So it needs the national priorities and uh, global solidarity at the regional and global level. And thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I uh, submitted my detailed statement uh, through email that was just, I, I, I uh, raised some points of the statement and thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And, and also thank you for shortening your statement and, um, and submitting it to the chair of the G77. And I'm sure that it will be circulated to the entire membership. Um, we have two final speakers before I turn the floor over to Ambassador Rodriguez. Um, we have a representative from Panama um, who is now invited to take, take the floor. Firstly, I would like to thank the Republic of Guyana for hosting this event and for its excellent work sharing the group of East 77 plus China this semester. 
We are uplifted by the strong statements made by our colleagues from the G77, and we expect these statements to be translated into solid commitments as part of the NDC update process and in line with the goal to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. The cornerstone measures of recovery plans updated NDCs in 2020 and long term strategies are ultimately one and the same, and the respective targets objectives must be achieved in a non mutually detrimental manner. The cornerstone elements must include accelerating sectoral transition plans and investments for green jobs generation, the fostering of carbon pricing policies to gradually lead to putting a price on carbon in the levels required by science and providing fiscal stimulus for reducing fossil fuel subsidies. Developed countries in particular must recognize that their own recovery process will be delayed if developing countries cannot stop the virus nor halt the damage to economic activity. Redirecting emerging markets growth to long-term low emission strategies will be a key driver of global decarbonization. Financing a resilient and socially just and environmentally sound recovery in Latin America will require the support from developed countries, debt alleviation for the countries with the higher debt, and favorable interest rates from multilateral financial institutions and development banks. But why is it so hard to do the right thing? Because if it wasn't hard, anybody could do it. This is why leaders must rise to the occasion to earn the right to be called leaders. In 10 years, the upcoming young generation who will be directing the course of our nations will look back at us and judge us for knowing what we knew to be right and going forward. Let's not forget that we have double visions in the past 30 years in the face of hard facts and warnings from the scientific community. We must oh. recognize this fact in order okay. to plan for more ambitious action. This is just what Adam is doing. Last week, we published a presidential decree which creates the institutional arrangements to fulfill Paris' objective and guide our economy toward carbon neutrality by 2050. We also believe climate transparency is the right for our people, and as such, have committed in the decree to facilitate to the public all data, including climate finance data, that can help communities and organizations to cut communities and build resilience. To close, it is well known that globally we have overcome dark periods in our history with sweat, courage, and tears. I am convinced that we will be able to overcome this crisis. But to do so, we must deliver. If we succeed, future generations will remember us for a long time. If we fail, our sons, daughters, grandsons, and granddaughters will never be able to forget that we paved the way for the utter destruction of the planet. We are the last generation with the opportunity to resolve this crisis, so let's get to work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and I really want to thank you for your very inspiring words. And our final speaker, last but by no means least, um, distinguished minister um, from Nicaragua, Paul Oquit. My very good friend, Paul, the floor is yours, minister. Thank you very much, Selwyn. Congratulations to the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for the excellent organization of this timely event. Nothing could restore the credibility of climate negotiation or set a more positive tone for COP26 in Glasgow than to be able to announce the annual $100 billion for 2020 and for 2021 have been assured with public funding and private institutional investor support for climate investment funds. As um, Bakir mentioned, the problem is that the appetite for uh, Annex One Treasury has already been tested and it amounts to less than 15 billion for 2018-2023 based on green climate fund and global environmental facility replenishment. The solution is to be found in private institutional investor funding. The uses of the 100 billion can be for grants, loans, equity financing, or guarantees. An international renewable energy investment fund, international energy efficiency fund, an international forestry investment fund with good internal rates of return could cap institutional equity investment. There's a marriage made in heaven waiting to be consummated 
between the insurance investment funds and climate finance. They can get a good rate of return with these types of equity investments and reduce their risk on the, um, on the insurance side. Fortunately, the UK team includes Mr. Mark Carney, ex-governor of both the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada with a 13 year stint in Goldman Sachs, eminently qualified to head resource mobilization and for whom $100 billion a year does not appear to be an insurmountable figure. Very, I was very pleased to see that in a high level UN SDG meeting, he in his intervention mentioned that it was necessary to go from billions to trillions for climate finance. And the way to do this would be through institutional investors. I hope, I'm hopeful that before Glasgow, we could get some good news in this regard. Thank you very much, Selwyn. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Paul, and thank you. And, and um, you made an excellent point. The insurance industry sits on on $30 trillion of assets and less than, than 10% um, of that, um, of those resources are devoted to um, towards investments in sustainable infrastructure. And given that the lifespan of those investments are long-term, um, as you correctly said, it is a marriage made, made in heaven. So, so really great points again. Um, colleagues, um, we've run out of time. Ambassador Rodriguez, I'm really sorry that I've um, um, taken so much time out of your sessions, session, but I think that this discussion was extremely useful and valuable. Um, I will not try to harvest the really excellent points that have been made, but um, there are some very clear threads that have run through the various interventions during the session, as well as the sessions before. The absolute imperative of international solidarity, both within and outside of the G77 is absolutely necessary. The challenges are around uh, predictability and the scale of climate finance improvements that are needed on the quality, um, um, concerns over access and balance. Um, many of you have also put on the table some very innovative solutions um, to all of these challenges. It will be critical um, uh, um, that we continue to pursue these um, really important points. Um, time is running out. We need to ensure that the recovery from the COVID crisis um, really helps us to accelerate not only decarbonization of the global economy, but it also helps us to build a resilient future, given that all G77 countries, but especially the SIDS, LDCs, African countries, and, and, and many of you, the smaller countries, are on the front lines of the climate fight, even as you're fighting to recover from the COVID crisis. So thank you so much for this opportunity to be back home in the G77. And I look forward to continuing to work um, with all of you over the coming months and years. Thank you so much. Ambassador Rodriguez, it's now over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hart, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all. Um, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has upturned our lives, uh, devastated our economies, and tested our health system uh, to uh, its core. Um, it has also exposed in very stark terms the structural issues that existed uh, long before the pandemic. Yet, the only thing that is worse than a pandemic is not learning from the pandemic and not harnessing the opportunities um, that would have surface during the crisis. Uh, for example, the use of uh, science uh, for policy making, establishing trust in science and using technology uh, for solutions. And so this session today is uh, expected to facilitate the sharing of experiences and lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic that we can apply in, in, in the fight against climate change. We have um, a distinguished list of speakers. Um, firstly, I would like to introduce to you um, our keynote speaker, Mr. Akim Steiner, and he is the administrator of the United Nations Development Program. But before Mr. Steiner joined uh, UNDP, 
He was also the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program for 10 years. And he was also the director general of the International Union for Conservation of Nature for about five years. He is therefore very well placed to give us this feature address on this very important topic. And I am advised that Mr. Sina would join us in uh, just a couple of minutes. I haven't seen him yet on the screen. And so if you would allow me, I would go directly then to our next speaker. And that would be His Excellency Shakti Bahadur Basnet, the Minister of Forests and Environment of the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, good evening from Nepal. It is a matter of great pleasure and privilege for me to participate and share few words at this virtual event. Allow me to extend my sincere gratitude to all of you for joining this important event. At the outset, let me congratulate the Cooperative Republic of China for assuming the chair of the Group 77 in China and assure you of Nepal's full support in the discharge of your responsibility. I also take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for organizing this event, which helped enhance our collaborative initiatives to address the consequences of climate change amidst COVID-19 pandemic. In the recent past, we have been experiencing the adverse impact of climate change posing the threat not only to the lives and livelihoods and settlement of the millions of people, but also disruption of physical structures, which has implication for service provision and the economy. Nepal is highly vulnerable to climate change risks and the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic combined with those of climate change have hardly hit the most poor and vulnerable people, particularly those who rely their livelihood on climate sensitive sector, such as agriculture and natural resources. Mr. Chair, the challenges posed by both climate change and COVID-19 are enormous and they are goal in nature, global in nature. Both require the international communities to work together and unite behind the signs. They remind us that we are living in a, an interconnected global community with a common goal of serving people and planet. The COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented changes to the way we lead our lives and our reliance on ICT connectivity has grown even faster than before science, technology and innovation will play a key role not only in post-COVID-19 recovery plans, but also in the decade of climate action, disaster risk reduction and the sustainable development. The developed and developing world are struggling to redirect resources to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. This may detrimentally impact the capacity of the international community to address the noted shortfall in climate investment. After COVID-19, we need to rapidly move towards the recovery and rehabilitation phase. Ideally, that focuses on green growth to drive transformational change, which supports sustainable development aspirations while reducing risk from climate change. It will be equally crucial that COVID-19 recovery packages include a strong component of fiscal support to technology and innovation intensive activities. A global pandemic and climate change are the critical problems where the sum of isolated efforts by national governments provide much less outcomes than the synergy of international collaboration. Mr. Chair, the only way to get ahead of the crisis is through groundbreaking technological innovation in climate change, including clean energy and low carbon technologies. It would be important to provide predictable and long-term policy signals in order to give potential innovators 
and adopters of climate friendly technologies covid-19 recovery presents both opportunities and threats to enhancing our resilience to climate change it is showing us that we require the technology innovation scientific understanding financial means and human capacity needed to tackle climate change it reminds us that we should reveal a green economy and move faster to create a resilient way of development and life protect the environment and environment and make our place a better for all as guided by scientific evidences all of us need to target on technology and innovation in low carbon and adaptation technologies to facilitate the changes needed in the decades ahead and build competitive advantages the covid-19 crisis has highlighted the importance of these areas if we are to understand fully the threats and learn how to manage them mr chair i am very much confident that the deliberation at this event will produce useful guidance for our countries in the long march towards combating climate change on behalf of nepal i express my solidarity to g77 and china and wish you a success in your presidency at the end i wish this virtual event very successful and productive thank you mr chair thank you so much thank you very much minister basnet for your presentation and for reminding us that we must unite behind the science and the need for technology innovation scientific understanding and finances uh, mr signer is not on as yet but we have with us um, today uh, two discussants and i would first like to turn to the honorable dr frank anthony the minister of health of guyana uh, minister frank anthony frank anthony you have the floor to give us your insights thank you very much uh, madam ambassador carlin rodrigues burkett uh, for allowing me to share uh, some thoughts on this very important topic as we know the effects of climate change on health uh, is well known it will affect billions of persons over the next few decades and will put uh, many lives and livelihood at risk during this century whether the earth's average surface temperature will increase uh, significantly above pre-industrial levels so whether it's at uh, increased by 2% uh, 2 degrees celsius or 4 or 5 degrees celsius as predicted by some model all of this would lead to direct and indirect uh, threats to global health we have already seen that with climate change that disease patterns are changing we have seen the spread of vector-borne diseases to places not known before and we have seen recent epidemics of Zika and chikungunya spreading to other parts of the world. And a lot of this has been attributed to climate change. We have that uh, there have been increased destruction of a number of ecological habitats, which is bringing human beings and animals closer together. And because they are getting closer together, we are seeing an un unprecedented rise of zoonotic diseases. Many have theorized that SARS, MERS, and SARS-2 have their origin from viruses jumping from uh, animals uh, to vulnerable human population. And we have to be mindful of these connections. As if this is not enough, we know that the effects of climate change, that we've had a number of heat waves which affect the elderly and of course other vulnerable population. And we know that climate change can influence or decrease the amount of water available uh, to parts of the world. And in some cases, flooding has destroyed uh, crops and other agricultural produce. Food security has become a big issue. And we have seen with food insecurity that we've had increases in malnutrition across the world. So extreme climate events can have a direct impact on our world. And as if this is not enough, 
we now have the COVID pandemic. But one of the things that we can learn from the COVID pandemic is the way in which we have to respond. We have had strong leadership coming out from global uh, bodies, regional bodies, and national government. We have had we have been able to mobilize a lot of use so that we can be able to discover uh, the structure of the virus and be able to respond appropriately to this virus. We have also been able to mobilize unprecedented amount of resources so that we can move and fund uh, to this pandemic. We have had various uh, ways of countries coming together. So we, we have lucky in how we respond to this pandemic. Now, these lessons that we have learned so far, we can be able to transfer some of these lessons to our fight uh, for uh, mitigation and ad adaptation with climate change. Uh, leadership is necessary, and we know we have had and these long battles of trying to get, uh, you know, conventions in place so that we can uh, reduce the impact of climate change. And despite some setbacks, we have persons who are leading in the right direction. And we need to import some of what we have just done with this COVID pandemic and bring it to the uh, fight for climate change. Uh, we also have been able to mobilize scientific talent, and we know that we can go faster uh, with innovations, with res research, so that we can be able to mitigate some of the effects of climate change. And therefore, one of the lessons from the pandemic that we can import uh, to climate change mitigation and adaptation is how do we intensify research and also adopt this research and use it uh, in our countries. Uh, so one of the other things that I want to point out is that, you know, with the pandemic, we were able to lift the level of urgency. And because, you know, of the amount of people that have been infected and the cases, as of yesterday, for example, WHO has reported that we've had 4 to 3.5 million uh, confirmed cases with 1.16 uh, million persons uh, dying. Now, because of this urgency, we have been able uh, to focus the world's attention to do all the things that I just spoke about. And I think while climate change is here and we know that it has these impacts on the lives and livelihood of people, because it has been long and drawn out and we are not seeing these vivid changes, perhaps one of the reasons that we are taking so long in adapting and trying to get mitigation mechanisms. And therefore, we need to have a different mindset and a different um, framework with how we work. And that framework obviously must include urgency. So as we deliberate today, I think there are many lessons that we can draw from the COVID pandemic and adapt it to how we respond to climate change. And uh, if we can do that, I think we'll make our world a better place. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Anthony, Minister of Health of Guyana, uh, for speaking with us. I know you are in a very unenviable seat at this point in time, but also for reminding us that one of the main lessons from this is how the level of urgency can be lifted. Before I give the floor to Mr. Akib Steiner, I would just like to remind uh, the audience, if you would like to take the floor, please indicate it um, in the chat. And, and with that, I will now give the floor to Mr. Steiner for his uh, feature address. Over to you, Mr. Steiner. Thank you so much, Excellency. And let me thank Guyana as chair of the G77 plus China for convening this session and for the invitation also to me as head of UNDP to, to join in the discussion today. I apologize that I came in earlier on, but because of the delay, I quickly switched to another event and uh, I'm very grateful that you enabled me to address you now. In listening to earlier statements and contributions, I must admit you have 
already heard a significant amount of um, both rationale, context, and um, information. And so I have put my speech aside because I think as head of the UN's development program, we feel a great sense of affinity to precisely the challenges that G77 plus China nations and economies face right now. And perhaps I can share a little bit from a reading of particularly the socioeconomic assessments that the UN family and the technical lead of UNDP has been undertaking in over 100 and I think it's 120 countries now, very much working with government, the international community, and then working towards recovery strategies. Because I think there is probably little doubt, and I was listening carefully earlier on, that through the, let's say, narrower lens of a climate change driven future, we all recognize that when you look at development investment decisions that are taken today and tomorrow for the next 10, 20 years, clearly just in the last few months, a low carbon future has become even more of a, a very clear driver in the way that our economies and by extension infrastructure investments, finance, energy systems, transport systems will evolve. So it, um, I think it's becoming, and you know, the announcements by China, but also by Korea, by Japan, the discussions in the European Union right now about an emissions reduction target of 55%, the net zero pathways that are unfolding. Um, we may be tempted to look at this just as a climate change issue, but if you take an SDG lens and perspective, then you very quickly recognize that to some extent action in this particular domain or goal immediately will shape many other decisions in the other domains as well. And sometimes we only conduct the climate change discussion from an emissions reduction perspective. For many countries on the African continent, this is still a debate about access to electricity. Um, for many developing countries, it is still a discussion, a set of choices about, about the future of mobility infrastructure, and therefore the decisions they, with a view of literally the urban centers of the future in the year 2040, 2050. And yet, and I think this is clearly something we always have to be conscious of, it is fair enough to ask, is it wise to frame a bold and transformational development agenda in the midst of a pandemic, when actually what we are facing is economic implosion, debt crisis, um, socioeconomic disruption on a scale not seen before, and a situation in which virtually every country developed or developing is facing a governance challenge that is unfolding simultaneously, and probably in the history of humanity, unprecedented in the way that it is synchronous in, in synchronicity unfolding right now. The reason why I think it is worth considering that is, um, first of all, that there is a very simple imperative. Countries have to expend at the moment um, public uh, budgets and uh, reserves to an extent that was unimaginable just a year ago. In trying to manage this crisis, stabilize its impact, whether in terms of containing the virus or containing the socioeconomic fallout, which in many countries has almost overtaken the virus, I think demands that we must design the crisis financing agenda with also the DNA of recovery and a return to development pathways in mind, because countries will not be able to expend these amounts twice. On the contrary, we will face a fiscally much more constrained reality in the years to come. And therefore, thinking about investments to stabilize the moment while actually laying the grounds for bold future transitions and transformations of economic development choices is absolutely central. And this is one reason why UNDP has very quickly refocused its attention on linking crisis management to development decision-making and investments. Secondly, it is also an opportunity because out of this crisis, countries will have to evolve back into both a national economic development reality, but also a global markets reality. Um, whether we believe that globalization has been a good or bad driver, I think we all know that the future of our nations are inextricably linked to a global economy, be it digital, be it macro financial, be it in terms of trade flows. And here is where the green recovery narrative, which may seem to some still a little bit exotic, suddenly becomes a very interesting opportunity. 
investments in energy. Um, we have seen the price of low carbon technologies drop phenomenally in the last 10 to 15 years. So this crisis moment is fundamentally different from a crisis moment even 10, 15 years ago in just the basic economics of, for example, energy infrastructure choices. Secondly, the element of distortion in our economy is that even in the emergency packages is reappearing with a significant amount of funding going back into very heavily fossil fuel-based infrastructure, enterprise, and markets is counterintuitive if you look for a moment at the reality that one of the heavy impositions on national budgets has been fossil fuel subsidies. The price of fossil fuels is at an almost historical low. This is a phenomenally important, unique opportunity to redress a fundamentally distorting set of subsidies that prevent an economy from investing in the infrastructure of the future because the economic forces of gravity are still locked in yesterday's economy. And therefore, again, the opportunity is now. We don't know how long it will last. And this is not a you know, decision about do we not do anything anymore with fossil fuels. It is to accelerate the transition and to take advantage of the moment. And the challenge that really I see every day in what we see in our interactions with our partners is this enormous challenge of designing smart policy responses on the one hand, which clearly challenge government because in the midst of crisis management, there are things that need to be understood, analyzed, and decided in virtually no time with enormous consequences. But many countries are in fact engaging in this right now. And this is why when we meet in October of 2020, the realization of Paris Agreement targets is far more likely, strangely enough, this month than it was 12 months ago. Some of you may not agree with this analysis, but that is at least a hypothesis I would offer why it is so important to look at this green recovery and green economy as defining the horizon against which development investments and recoveries and markets need to be understood. And I end by just pointing to the other great variable, which is finance. Beyond the fiscal uh, space that governments represent in terms of public finance, um, whether it is taxpayers' money or whether it is also borrowing in terms of um, um, bonds on the market, we need to look also to private finance, the financial markets, the investors. Um, wherever you look in the world, most countries' economies have at most a 20 to 30 percent uh, contribution from public finance in their GDP. That means the vast majority of investment decisions, economic drivers of uh, the future of an economy are taken within the domain of markets of the private sector aligning the incentives, the signals for that enormous financial power, which even in the smallest um, economies, in low-income economies, there is always a degree of private capital that is either mobilizable and with the right incentives can be deployed into the national economy in alignment with public policy objectives or simply chooses to go abroad and invest somewhere on the New York Stock Exchange or in Hong Kong or wherever it might do so. That power of being able to use public policy and government in this crisis to attract investments of a different quality with a different um, signal also of the future of national development policy making and markets is critical in the next 12 to 24 months. The reality that many countries are sensing right now is that we have all been disappointed with the OECD response, with the G20 capacity to respond on a scale that each country itself has been able to take in, in responding to COVID-19, we have not seen a commensurate response yet um, on a global level. Countries are, in the first instance, very much dependent on their own domestic policy decisions in the next few months. The more these are an attractive proposition for the future, the more we will also be able to crowd in and attract additional finance, uh, be it concessional or private investment. And I think Mexico's recent SDG bond that it launched in Europe, which was oversubscribed six times, is an interesting indicator um, because it raised over $900 um, million in terms of a priority agenda that Mexico has set for itself. Um, we have seen Indonesia go on to the financial markets with the green Zukuk in the terms of Islamic finance, being able to raise a billion dollars very quickly 
the European Union stepping with its $750 billion uh, financing plans onto the financial markets now and seeing them oversubscribe. The world is afloat with money. The question is, can countries shape the ability to tap into that in terms of their national interest or simply the financial markets. And here, we need to also tackle something of great urgency. If you are the United States, in October 2020, you can raise a billion dollars for one year in a bond and pay 0.12% interest. If you are Kenya and you want to do the same, you are paying 7.6% interest. That is perhaps the greatest Achilles heel that currently defines the inequity of our financial markets and systems that need to be addressed also with the Bretton Woods institutions and the G20. Excellency, thank you so much for allowing me to share a few of these thoughts and my formal speech will also be available to you for, for the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Steiner, for, your, uh, for sharing with us these insights and for pointing out uh, where there are, are differences as well, the last example you gave us, uh, but also uh, uh, for your optimism on what can be achieved in October of this year, vis-a-vis -vis the Paris Agreement. And we would very much hope to prove you, um, that you prove us that you were right on this. Um, and with that, I would now like to um, turn over the discussion to Ms. Uh, Sarah Cliff, the Director of New York University Center on International Cooperation for her perspectives. Ms. Cliff, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Rodriguez. Uh, excellencies, colleagues, I'm very grateful for the invitation from the government of Guyana as chair of the Group of 77 and China to this important and timely event. I also have changed and shortened my remarks given other speakers, so I will just cover four main points. Um, COVID-19, as we know, is not only a public health emergency, it's also caused the deepest socioeconomic shock since World War II and the broadest since 1870. Like any crisis, it's an opportunity for transformation, and this is where my four points will uh, focus. The first is on urgency and the political narrative. This is a year in which we have seen ourselves helpless before the forces of nature, a microscopic virus, as the Secretary General says, because we did not take pandemic threats seriously enough. Climate is the most obvious other face of the overwhelming forces of nature for which we are insufficiently prepared, and we should link the political narrative between the two. We owe this to our children to take the shock the experience has given us and use it in our approach to climate where action pre-pandemic was creeping rather than soaring, as one speaker said, to take seriously and urgently the policies and finances that will avoid global catastrophe. The second lesson is on interlinkages. The COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare for us the links between a public health crisis that has rapidly led to a socioeconomic crisis and that is now risking fiscal debt and political instability. I believe that our COVID-19 recovery programs and our approach to climate will need in particular to address the linkages between the pandemic, climate change and inequality, a triple vulnerability as Alicia Barsana put it earlier today. There is new research evidence that links climate factors to the risk of pandemics, as Dr. Anthony mentioned, and that links inequality as a major contributor to the difficulties we are having in containing the pandemic. These three linked issues, climate, inequality, and pandemic risk, are the existential crises for our societies, the challenges causing the greatest despair to our youth when they look at their futures. The third point is on possible policy directions in the COVID recovery programs. And here, it may seem too much to ask that we could address climate and inequality while we are also fighting an immediate and continued public health crisis. But I agree, agree very strongly with Akim Steiner's point that since countries are anyway having to put through large stimulus uh, and emergency recovery packages in relation to COVID-19, there is a real opportunity to make sure that these include designs that will favour action on climate and action on inequality. 
we can do all three at once if we design recovery programs smartly. And I have longer comments that can be circulated on the opportunities here, but I would just highlight five points. One is on sustainable, decent jobs and social protection, including green jobs within the COVID-19 recovery programs. The second, which Akim also mentioned, is on the replacement of fossil fuel subsidies with social protection at scale. The third is on food security and sustainable food production, channeling investments into agricultural and food supply chain technologies. The fourth on transport. Most countries' transport systems have been very badly hit by the pandemic. Reforming uh, the approach to them to make them address underserved communities as well as be more sustainable in energy and climate terms is an opportunity in the recovery. And the fifth and last is on digital connectivity, where we know that COVID-19 has really exposed the lack of connection both within countries and between countries to what we now see is uh, an absolutely basic uh, tool for this century. My last point is on financing. All of the policies and, and programs I just briefly described above are ones that would benefit both climate and socioeconomic uh, inequality in the recovery from COVID, but they all cost money. COVID has indeed showed, and many speakers have referred to this, what we can do when the political narrative shifts towards doing what it takes, as it has on public finance within OECD countries. But developing countries have access to only a fraction of that. We need to expand this to a much larger global financial package, as Minister Bassnett and Akin both said, through special drawing rights and other mechanisms, and through aligning the incentives and signalling on financing to support both COVID recovery and green transitions. Many thanks again for your time and for the opportunity to participate in this very important discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cliff, for your presentation. Um, succinct but very deep. And in the interest of, of time, I will go immediately into the uh, to hear the two uh, countries that have requested the floor. And I would first give the floor to the DPR of Thailand. DPR, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, and all protocols observed. I would like to thank Guyana for this a very important initiative in your capacity as a share of the G77 in China. And we thank the previous speakers you know, for all the other sessions as well for sharing their valuable insights. Please allow me to share three uh, reflections. Excellencies, this moment is a turning point to shift gears towards building back better and greener to achieve COVID-19 recovery, hand in hand with environmental sustainability. Learning from the COVID-19 experiences, we must leverage science, technology, and innovation in making science-based policy decisions and seeking innovative solutions to build long-term resilience to climate change. In our case, Thailand has been applying the bio, circular, and green economy model in our recovery efforts, heading towards sustainable growth that nurtures the environment and generates decent jobs for the people. Secondly, Thailand also supports the development of local innovative climate solutions. We are honored that uh, Thailand's Jolalongkorn Centenary Park Project won the 2020 UN Global Climate Action Awards. Designed by a young Thai female landscape architect, this project uses nature-based solutions to increase adaptability to reduce urban flooding in Bangkok, which has been exacerbated by climate change. Uh, another lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic is that we can mobilize collective efforts across countries and sectors when there is a will to do so by what the world is currently doing to develop COVID-19 vaccines. While recognizing the importance of climate action by all, we would like to reiterate the leading roles of developed countries under the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement we welcome the entry into force of the Doha Amendment of the Kyoto Protocol in December this year, which serves as a stark reminder of the need for Annex One countries to enhance their post-2020 ambitions. On Thailand's part, we have already submitted and updated nationally determined contributions earlier this week with the targets of reducing green 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 20 to 25 percent by the year 2030. Uh, excellencies, uh, in closing, even as the world has come to a standstill from COVID-19, we must not stop our efforts to address climate change. In this light, we need to see more ambitions, collective actions, global solidarity and cooperation on the road towards COP26 in Glasgow next year. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, DPR. I now would like to give the floor to Algeria. You have to un unmute Algeria, please. Exactly. Go ahead, Algeria. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, allow me to thank, uh, first of all, Guyana for uh, organizing uh, such important events in a context of uh, this uh, pandemic COVID-19. And uh, I would like to highlight some, some facts. Uh, this pandemic has proven uh, once again that it's necessary to review as a human being our bond with nature. This is the first thing. To ensure a better future for the next generations, we have to think in accordance with this vision, which should be inclusive. The post-COVID-19 world should not look uh, like what it, uh, what it was before. To ensure our well-being, and development to, to, to live in harmony with nature. Secondly, Algeria is very committed to the preservation of Mother Earth, and it goes for, far from what is provided by the Paris Agreement by setting the objective of reducing 23% of its greenhouse gas emission by 2030. Uh, Algeria also is a strong, is building a strong partnership, energy and energy efficiency. Strong, uh, strong partner, partnership, sorry, to accelerate technology transfer in, in first, first of all, and mobilize adequate financing to fully implement its national program. Ensure proper maintenance and to installation and reach these ambitious targets. In this, uh, in this framework, we think that we must act immediately as the international community due to the threats that represent climate change. And it is devastating effects at all levels and in all fields. The COVID-19 represents an opportunity that the world must seize to rebuild back better through development pathways that ensure a balance between economic, social, and environmental aspects that leave no country and no one behind. In this regard, I think that there are some elements, basic elements, which should be highlighted. First of all, the historical responsibility of de developing countries. And this did not impede us to act collectively, but differentiate with differentiation. This is the first element. The second, the mobilization of the financial resources. We call open the developing countries to fulfill their commitments in this regard. Another element also, which I, which I mentioned before, the, it's about the transfer of technology. It's very important to work in this regard. And in all this context, we have to take into consideration, into consideration the, the capacity building, which should be reinforced by, by providing technical assistance. And also taking into account the national context and the circumstances of every country. Without that, it will be very difficult for the internet international community to overcome the situation of climate change, in particular in the context of the pandemic COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohammed. Um, we have um, come to the, to the end of this uh, session. And in the interest of time, I'll just make a, 
four points, uh, perhaps um, what I consider the, the main takeaway. And one, the first one is that we must uh, unite behind the science. And secondly, if we could have the same level of urgency with which we treated this pandemic with treating climate, that would take us forward faster. And thirdly, to ensure that as we recalibrate and plan uh, our development paths going forward, that we must include crisis management as countries cannot afford to spend what they have spent on this pandemic a second time. And thirdly, the we must use this opportunity to address both climate um, and inequality, not that they are mutually uh, exclusive, and issues such as food security. And the point that there is a direct link between climate change and pandemics was also made. Uh, I would um, also like to thank at this point in time our keynote speaker and all of the speakers that um, have contributed during this panel and would now like to hand over to Dr. Susan Gardner, uh, Director Ecosystem Division of the United Nations Environment Program uh, to take us through the fourth and final panel. Over to you, Dr. Gardner. Dr. Gardner, you have the floor. Maybe I can ask IT support to see if Dr. Gardner is having a difficulty connecting. I'm not I seeing, believe. yes, Dr. Gardner, are you on? Okay, um, once Dr. Gardner uh, joins us, um, I think she is not muted, they're saying IT. Could you assist us in muting Dr. Gardner? She is not she muted, not here. muted. She's now muted. Dr. Gardner, you have the floor to carry on the next session. I think she's speaking, but we're not hearing her. Colleagues, bear with us uh, for a few seconds. Let's see if we can have if we can have Dr. Gardner's problems fixed. The issue seemed to be perhaps in the interest of time, and once Dr. Gardner uh, joins us, I'll hand over to her, but perhaps we can start with uh, our first speaker, Honorable uh, Mr. Shahab Udin, Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, um, to make his presentation. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, participating, honorable minister, and vice ministers, distinguished delegates, and experts. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. 
at the beginning let me congratulate and sincere gratitude to the government of the guyana for organizing of ministerial meeting for the effective chairmanship of group 77 and china ecosystem based adaptation to climate change is the best way of dealing the climate change through mitigate natural structure and functioning of the ecosystem and natural resources healthy ecosystem is the underpinning of the people's efforts to adapt to the climate change so it is significantly important to explore better use of nature based solution to cope against negative impacts of climate change and to increase the climate resilient development efforts excellency considering the time limit let me sh share one specific example on bangladesh you know every year our coastal area populations have been experienced hardest hit by both extreme climate events such as strong cyclones and storm surges moreover coastal region have also been experienced moderate climate events like severe salinity instruction and coastal inundation so the government has been putting greater emphasis on expanding coastal afforestation program and construction of the coastal embankment and cyclone shelters at the same time we are also paying special attention to the conservation of sundarbans the largest mangrove forest in the world our coastal green belt initiative involve mangrove plantation along nearly 9000 km shoreline recently in the celebration of the birth centenary of the father of the nation bangabandhu sheikh mujibur rahman who have planted 10 million trees across the county during july october 2020 as a part of achieving 25% forest uh, coverage by 2030 we have integrated ecosystem based adaptation in bangladesh environment policy 2018 not only to uh, augment ecosystem based approaches in the uh, greater policy regime but to move ahead with the vision of living in harmony with nature in implementing coastal afforestation program we try to adopt ecosystem based approach taking into the account to the importance of meeting the needs of the local community maintaining the nature resource based sustainable manner the significant adaptation response measure we use the development and implementation of the fff forest fish fruit model a mondich model that comprises short and long term resource and income generation as well as livelihood diversification it afford 
offers multiple livelihood opportunities such as uh, horticulture and fish cultivation, irrigation for crops, and conversion of burned land and into productive land. We have also extensively uh, practiced floating agriculture in an unhindered areas due to long duration flooding and water uh, logging across the country. Excellency, we also feel that integrated use of the nature-based solution within development activities, particularly infrastructure planning, and the development should consider mutually reinforcing relationship between infrastructure planning and development and natural ecosystem. With the service provided by nature being pressured by development activities and the uh, physical impacts of the climate change, taking an integrated view of countries, infrastructure, system, and ecosystem services can greatly help to achieve win and win outcome. As a result, the countries can simultaneously reduce the losses due to natural disaster, adapt with and mitigate the long-term impacts of climate change, and enhance livelihood opportunities for nature development countries, communities. However, uh, enhancing the mobilization of resources from all sources, domestic and international, public and private, is not only fundamental to achieve of climate goals with ecosystem-based approaches, but also to poverty, elevation, livelihood, and sustainable development as a whole. I convey my sincere thanks and gratitude to Excellency Mr. Hilton Tudo and his able team for organizing this successful uh, event. I thank you all. Thank you, Honorable Minister Udin, for your presentation and for reminding about the importance to integrate ecosystem-based approaches in policies and that we can have with
this is a, a really a very timely initiative, and we welcome this opportunity to, to share our views about the relationship between ecosystem-based approaches and climate change. The ecosystem approach is one of the pillars of the regime of the Convention on Biological Diversity. CBD decision 711 presents a short description of the concept as, and I quote, a strategy for the integrated management of land, water, and living resources that promotes conservation and sustainable use in an equitable way. The same decision then describes the concept in great detail in terms of 12 principles covering the three objectives of the convention in an integrated manner. Ecosystem-based approaches are an important tool for adaptation and, to a lesser extent, mitigation of climate change. The first aspect was already well addressed by Minister Bowman, who shared with us the views and the lessons learned by Bangladesh, a country whose adaptation policies are among the most ambitious and well-conceived in the world, I dare say. I will therefore focus uh, my speech on the dimension of uh, mitigation. As I said, uh, ecosystem approaches can and do contribute to climate change mitigation, although their potential is smaller than in the case of adaptation. Terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems can contribute to climate change mitigation through biological carbon dioxide sequestration. The carbon is then stored in the form of living biomass, soil carbon and underwater sediment. Biological carbon sequestration occurs naturally on a huge scale, as we know. That is why oxygen accounts for nearly 21% of the atmosphere whereas the share of carbon dioxide, despite some recent increases, accounts for only 0.04%. Nevertheless, the potential to increase biological carbon sequestration is limited, and even more so is our ability to store it in the long term. According to the IPCC special report on climate change and lands, I quote, Agriculture, forestry, and other land use accounts for roughly 23% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Approximately half of this amount is due to agriculture and the other half to land use change. There is thus limited use and limited room for reducing net emissions from agriculture with the growing world population and increasing food demand. Nevertheless, Brazil's low carbon agriculture program, which we call ABC, is an effort in this very direction. Comprising actions such as reducing emissions from fertilizers, improved animal husbandry and manure management no-till planting techniques that increase soil carbon and combine agriculture and forestry techniques that increase living biomass stocks. There are also opportunities for reducing emissions from land use change, and Brazil is committed to contributing to these efforts by fighting illegal deforestation. There is also room for increased biological carbon sequestration through the recovery of forests and other terrestrial ecosystems, mangroves and marine ecosystems. However, the potential for these actions is limited, except for the careful and expensive recovery of pre-existing degraded ecosystems, any large-scale intervention such as ocean fertilization and uh, tree planting in previously non-forested areas involves high risks of biodiversity degradation. It's equally important to, to note that uh, biological carbon stocks, such as living biomass, soil carbon, and underwater sediment, 
are intrinsically unstable and forests are vulnerable. Carbon-rich soils are liable to various forms of degradation and underwater organic sediment can suffer fermentation leading to methane and carbon dioxide emissions. Bearing in mind the above mentioned limitations and risks, the potential contribution of ecosystem-based approaches to climate change mitigation is clearly secondary. Ecosystems are a key value in their own right, but they are not the solution to climate change, and we should not delude ourselves about that. The key strategy to mitigate climate change is energy transition, as nearly three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions come, as we all know, from fossil fuels. The challenge, therefore, is to keep carbon underground where it has been for millions of years and not try to capture and store it in unstable biological stocks. In addition to the above mentioned environmental problems, attempts to offset fossil emissions with biological carbon sequestration raise serious problems of distribute justice. On the one hand, there are those countries with the highest historical and current per capita emissions due to fossil fuel use, to intense fossil fuel use, which are essentially located in the developed world. On the other hand, there are those countries with higher potential for biological carbon sequestration, which in their vast majority are developing countries with low historical and current per capita emissions, mostly located in the tropics. The exaggerated focus that many actors are putting on biological carbon sequestration to offset fossil fuel emissions is a frontal violation of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities which is the central pillar of the climate regime. It amounts to asking those who already consume very little to take care of the consequences of the unsustainable behavior of those who consume too much. As a final remark, I would like to commend the G77 presidency for the very precise manner in which it has framed this debate in terms of ecosystem-based approaches. There are lots of facts in environmental debates of which the latest fashion is nature-based solutions and or NBS. There is no internationally agreed definition of this phrase and actors have often used it in different and even contradictory senses. NBS adds nothing but confusion to our efforts to promote sustainable development. We should thus stick to the notion of ecosystem approach and do our utmost to make it a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice Minister. It's so helpful to see the perspective from the Brazil in terms of the commitments uh, that are engaged in if, uh, deforestation and, recover and recovery as part of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. It's so timely to have the, this type of attention. At the same time, reminding us all that it's uh, not one solution is going to be su sufficient. We need every tool in the tool belt. Um, and certainly getting clarification about terms is going to be an important way to ensure we're all, uh, we all understand what we mean when we just use some of this terminology. Um, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, it's an honor now to give the floor to the Minister of Forest for Papua New Guinea. Uh, Your Excellency Solan Nisimi, you have the floor, please. I'm not seeing uh, the minister. Yes, I don't. He, he's he's not present in the call right now. All right. Well, if we have a chance uh, to reach the minister 
afterwards, uh, we'll go on to our next speaker and potentially final speaker. Um, Mr. Kevin Conrad is the executive director for the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. Um, Mr. Conrad, it would be wonderful to hear uh, your perspective on what you've been hearing throughout this session, um, how it connects to ecosystem-based management uh, and approaches um, to in the focus of this conversation. Mr. Conrad, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gardner. Uh, let me also thank His Excellency Udin and also the excellent comments from His Excellency Marzano. I think as we've heard, effective land management could sequester more than 100% of current annual CO2 emissions. Let me say that again. Effective land management, forests, agriculture, and soils could sequester more than 100% of our current annual CO2 emissions. Presidents, ministers, excellencies, as many of you have mentioned today, forest and agriculture, land is critical, and the G77 can contribute significantly to a future which remains below 1.5 degrees. Hear this, to meet our climate goals, forests, agricultural, and soils can and they must lead the way. The IPCC estimates that our unsustainable land practices may currently be contributing about 25% of our total carbon emissions, and let me say this, 44% of our global methane releases. Reframed, however, land could provide 100% of the necessary solution, but only for a limited time. As we know, natural systems have limits. Don't get me wrong. We must transition to 100% carbon neutral energy. Scaling up renewable energy is fundamental to climate stability. But here's the point. By combining this transition, along with the full implementation of the red mechanism and regenerative our agriculture, we can ensure a future below 1.5 degrees. It's not gonna be easy, but it's possible. And the world at large is beginning to understand this. Sir David Attenborough recently released A Life on Our Planet, what he calls his witness statement. Sir David argues that by rewilding our world, we can both defeat climate change and reverse biodiversity loss. At the same time, a documentary called Kiss the Ground highlights that soils are critical to a stable climate future. As I started with, according to a study by the Rodale Institute, if we converted all our global croplands and pastures to regenerative agriculture, we could sequester more than 100% of current annual CO2 emissions. Distinguished delegates, the G77 can lead the way here, underpinned by sufficient and predictable financial support. Full implementation of the Red Plus mechanism and regenerative agriculture does not need to wait for technology. The technology of how not to cut a tree is very well known. And humanity has been growing food using natural systems for 200,000 years. This sustainable approach ensures food security for our people. It provides sustainable livelihoods for our rural communities. In the context of the Paris Agreement, the Red Plus mechanism is the only tool that is complete and it is delivering over eight gigatons of Red Plus results are already up and posted and we're just getting started. Of great concern, as we all know, the current financial support is woefully insufficient and unpredictable. Only about 4% of those results have been paid for and retired. Colleagues, as humans, we figured out how to sell $1.2 trillion of soft drinks annually, just plain sugar water. At the same time, we've invented financial systems that currently oversee more than 100 trillion. The point is simple. To say that we as society cannot figure out how to raise something on the scale of 1 trillion annually to defeat climate change is ridiculous. We can and we must. Reliance on global funds, however, will never lead to success. We must harness the global economy, but we must be thoughtful. Technology important, but it's not a panacea. 
For example, there's a muddle-headed fixation today on technology-based removals. The extractive pressures on our natural resources that will be necessary to sufficiently scale up such machinery is unsustainable. The true full costs are astronomical. Think about it. Presidents, ministers, excellencies, we know what to do. We know how to do it. To save the planet, protect our forest. To save the planet, regenerate our soils. Our future hangs in the balance. The full implementation of the Red Plus mechanism and a global return to regenerative agriculture can be scaled globally and it can start today. For this reason, the CFRN launched the Red Plus platform. Colleagues, we have 10 years to significantly bend the curve. Together, we can achieve a future below 1.5 degrees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Conrad. Uh, very inspiring and, uh, and enthusiastic uh, description of what can be done through ecosystem-based approaches. Um, we have one more request for the floor, um, and then I'll attempt to summarize the, what we've heard from this session. Um, Ambassador uh, Lopez from El Salvador, I understand you have requested the floor. The floor is yours, please. Thank you so much for giving me the floor, uh, Madam Moderator. I would like to express our appreciation to Guyana for convening this meeting and to all the panelists for their important remarks. El Salvador is located in one of the richest areas of biodiversity in the world. We have six ecoregions with diverse tropical ecosystems. Various tools, plans, and policies have been developed in accordance to international commitments to restore degraded lands protect natural ecosystem, mangroves, among others. During the United Nations Biodiversity Summit of last September 30, our Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources highlighted the importance of the relationship between people and na nature. He expressed that all of our efforts in innovation, international trade, economy, and social policies must be carried out to prevent irreversible damage to ecosystems and biodiversity. This action should not be forgotten, especially in the context of the pandemic. In this sense, we believe that we need to promote the inclusion of nature and climate in all response and recovery strategies to COVID-19 and in our efforts towards the achievement of the 2030 Agenda and to combat climate change and its impact. In this sense, we wish to highlight four priorities. First, we must work to increase in adaptation, restoration, and resilience. El Salvador has begun a process of restoration and inclusive conservation of ecosystems throughout the territory. We have established the Directorate of Climate Change Adaptation, as well as the Environmental Multi-Hazard Observatory, whose main function is the systemic monitoring of meteorological and hydrological phenomena, water and air quality, early warning, planning, and protection. Second, recovery the economy. Build the foundations of our, of our national circle economy is one of the priorities. And one of its approaches is to address the drivers of marine coastal biodiversity loss, working hand in hand with the private sector. Third, tourism recovery. El Salvador is working on a roadmap to face the crisis by creating biosafety mechanisms and protocols for an orderly reactivation of the economy, with the tourist sector as one of the drivers. El Salvador has provided financial support to the tourist sector in 32 municipalities of the coastal marine area with the support of the IDB, allowing the tourism entrepreneurs to adjust their facilities, to take measures, and comply with biosecurity protocols and improve the quality of the services while protecting of our national resources. And fourth, energy diversification. This is a key commitment of the government of the President Nayib Bukele. We are convinced that an environmental sustainable development model must guarantee the use of natural resources, integrating ecology and technology. We're currently doing efforts to promote investments in renewable energies. In this sense, we have started uh, the operations of Capella Solar Plan, 
This is the largest installed capacity in Central America. The benefits of these investments go beyond reducing energy costs. They aim to create jobs and to protect our environment and to rebuild better. Finally, we would like to recall that last year, the UN General Assembly adopted the UN Decade of on Ecosystem Restoration 2021-2030. And it is our hope that these, among other initiatives, will provide the foundations for coordinated efforts towards the rest restoration of our ecosystems. I thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, it was an excellent way to round out the conversation, um, highlighting really the importance of ecosystems and investment in natural areas as part of a strategy for obtaining the 2030 agenda. Uh, ecosystems uh, are so important for adapt adaptation and resilience to climate change, as well as mitigation, protecting human health, and ensuring strong economies. Uh, we've been reminded of both the blue and the green side of ecosystem investments and the services that they provide. Uh, we understand that this is going to require engagement with all different sectors. And certainly the transformation in food systems is an essential part of ensuring both restoration and conservation of natural intact ecosystems. Uh, but we heard just now about the opportunities as well from sectors like tourism that can really motivate and be drivers of investment. Um, energy transformation is part of the solution, and this is uh, a number of different uh, approaches that in the tool belt will all be needed simultaneously. Um, but as Mr. Conrad said, uh, we can ensure a future below 1.5 degrees. Um, it just means at this point that we're going to be building back better and making the right kinds of investments uh, for a long-term sustainable future. Thank you very much for the contributions to the session. Uh, it's my pleasure now to turn the meeting back to uh, the Honorable uh, Hugh Todd, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, we are returning it back in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You very thank much. you very thank much. You very much. Uh, and thank you for thank staying you with for us. Staying with we're us. We're we're past, past the past scheduled past time, past but that is uh, understandable because we've had some engaging and rich discussions. And I know that you will see with us for um, going beyond the scheduled time. So thank you for staying with us. At this point in time, we've arrived at the closing session. And I would like Ambassador Forbes July to read or to present the communique for us. Ambassador July. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Honorable. Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. I take this opportunity to present the communique which reflects what would have transpired during the course of today's deliberations at this flagship event on the occasion of Guyana's chairmanship of the Group of 77 and China. Introduction. The virtual flagship event under the theme, quote, maintaining a low carbon development path towards the 2030 agenda in the era of COVID-19, unquote, was convened on 29th of October, 2020, by His Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, on the occasion of Guyana's 2020 chairmanship of the Group of 77 and China. The event brought together ministers and senior policymakers of developing countries to facilitate awareness and partnership building knowledge sharing and lesson learning with respect to climate action amid the COVID-19 crisis. While recovering towards the 2030 agenda to reinforce the Position. positions of developing countries on key issues on climate change, 
including climate finance and ecosystem-based approaches, while contributing to maximize sustainable development goals, the SDGs, co-benefits, and to highlight the main concerns and actions of the group. The discourse was informed by a key note message by His Excellency Antonio Gutierrez, United Nations Secretary General. This communique highlights key messages emanating from the flagship event. Key messages. One, five years ago, all parties agreed to keep global warming to well below two degrees and to pursue efforts to work towards 1.5 degrees, reflecting the principle of equity common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Noting with concern the serious gaps in pre-2020 ambitions and implementation by developed countries, developing countries including small islands and low-lying coastal developing states are facing increasing challenges imposed by climate change, but are least equipped to respond to these impacts. Two. While countries have pledged to implement policies and measures through their nationally determined contributions, NDCs, parties have different responsibilities and capabilities. Developed countries are not only obligated to act, but they also have the financial and fiscal capabilities to raise mitigation ambition and emissions reduction targets to a level that will enable achievement of the goals under the Paris Agreement and to provide finance, technology, development and transfer and capacity building support to developing countries. Developing countries, including those of the Group of 77 and China, are stymied in relation in realizing their ambition to act because they are faced with unsurmountable financing challenges. The COVID-19 COVID pandemic is having increasingly serious impact on all countries and have exposed underlying vulnerabilities of health and social systems and the fragility of economies, especially among developing countries. All countries have been affected with shrunk economies and diversion of resources to fund health-related economic stimulus. It is also recognized that both climate change and COVID-19 can impact progress towards the SDGs. It is therefore critical that there be a commitment to affirmative action on climate change rather than a lowering of ambition. Four, against this backdrop, financing for mitigation and adaptation to climate change is more critical today than ever before. To date, developing countries have failed to live up to their Developed countries have failed to live up to their obligation to provide new, additional, predictable, and adequate climate financing to assist developing countries in realizing their ambition to grow along low-carbon pathways and develop resiliency. Developed countries have also not lived up to their obligation to promote, facilitate, and finance the transfer of or access to environmentally sung technologies and know-how to developing countries. Five, the goal of mobilizing $100 billion annually by 2020 remains on the distant horizon and there is a lack of transparency in efforts to track it. Tracking methodologies have been determined without the involvement of recipient countries. It is essential that developed countries recognize that it is in all countries' interests to address this issue and find solutions with urgency. In doing so, the countries of the Group of 77 and China have to be included in devising the methodology for tracking climate finance. Shortfalls are identified, need to be communicated only, openly, sorry, and honestly. This means that by COP26 in Glasgow, trust can be built and the finance gap can be reduced significantly. Developing countries remain committed to investing in renewable energy sources and reducing dependencies on fossil fuels, but 
most countries can only do this if adequate financing, finance and financing mechanisms are available to overcome obstacles that are currently preventing countries from realizing their ambition. Six, if the obligations and commitments by developed countries are fully delivered, developing countries have an opportunity to unleash the potential of many nationally-led solutions proposed by the Group of 77 and China, including the energy transition in small states, including SIDS, as well as larger countries. Proposals on incentivizing affordable private finance investment in renewable energy. Rainforest countries also remain willing to reduce and avoid deforestation and practice sustainable forest management and conservation with the proper financial incentives. In order for many of the aforementioned opportunities to come to fruition, it is essential that the provisions ag agreed in the Paris ag Agreement for Internationally Transferable Mitigation Outcomes, ITMOs, be operationalized by COP. 26. Seven, apart from ensuring the significant public funded component of climate finance by developed countries, more resources can be leveraged and mobilized from other sources. It is essential that collaboration is boosted through urgent action to update the policies and financial tools of the international system to incentivize private sector participation in ambitious climate action. Eight, it should be recognized that a few countries have pioneered workable, homegrown models that have incentivized moving to a low-carbon growth trajectory, while also addressing emission reduction and removals, for example, through avoided deforestation. Guyana's efforts in this regard are recognized through its Low Carbon Development Strategy, LCDS, and payment for forest climate services model between Guyana and Norway, which has incentivized sustainable forest management and avoided deforestation. This represents the first national scale model of Red Plus and one of the first national level strategies on low carbon development. The success of the LCDs and Guyana's uh, and Guyana Norway model helped support the development of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which provided the opportunity for the trading of internationally transferable mitigation outcomes. Work is on the way to operationalize this, which could realize wider participation by forest countries in Red Plus. Guyana will be realigning its LCDs to take LCDS to take on board payment for eco ecosystem services while redoubling efforts at building climate resilience and diversifying and growing the economy along a low carbon growth path. A wider range of financing options will be pursued to include bilateral, multilateral, and private capital. Nine, given that COP26, which was originally scheduled for November 2020, has been postponed a full year, it is essential that comprehensive, balanced, and meaningful dialogue continue. The Group of 77 and China will use the opportunity to work with all parties to enable the Glasgow COP to deliver successful and meaningful outcomes. Georgetown, 29th October, 2020. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador July, for the presentation of the communique, which reflects the concerns and actions of the entire group and is so endorsed. On behalf of His Excellency, the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali and the people of Guyana, I would like to thank all of our participants for contributing in this flagship event under the theme maintaining a low carbon development path towards the 2030 agenda in an era of COVID-19. It has been a very fruitful and engaging event. And on behalf of the people of Guyana, I would like to thank you very much for your participation, for your contribution. And we look forward to continued engagement as we continue our march 
um, to advance climate action as we move towards COP26 to see the realization and action from all member states involved. I thank you. Good evening, good night, and good morning. Thank you.